This program is recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. This is a rebroadcast of the Eau Claire School Board meeting. The audio for this program can be heard on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. All right, good evening. Let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance for tonight's uh, Board of Education meeting. Pledge of All right, thank you. Uh, Secretary Iverson, have we complied with the open meetings laws this evening? Yes, we have. Thank you. Uh, could you please do a roll call vote? Commissioner Duax? Here. Commissioner Hombach Boyle? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Luganbill? Here. Commissioner Spindler? Here. Commissioner Vu? Here. Commissioner Jean? Here. Great, thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is the public forum for this evening, and uh, we have uh, two people signed up. Uh, typically, uh, the forum, we have four minutes and a total of 30 minutes for the forum. So, uh, Karen, I think we have you up first. Okay, just state your name and address and go ahead. Good morning or good afternoon, I should say, or even good evening. <laughs> um, my name is Karen Itso. I work with the Eau Claire School District. I live at 5010 159th Street in Chippewa Falls. I would like to make a comment regarding the approval for the item that is on the consent resolution for policy number 447.1, which is restraint and seclusion. Um, I have a concern with the interpretation of the new line that's added to the policy, um, quote unquote, protection of property. I'm aware of other sample policies um, from WASD that do not include property destruction. So I'd like to emphasize that how this message is communicated to staff is very important. I'm hoping there is clear wording in the rules that will continue to ensure physical restraint is used as a last resort when there is clear, present, present and imminent danger rather than used when staff are frustrated or do not know what to do. Since our actions as adults can strengthen our damaged relationships with students, we need to remember that restraint should only be used when the student's behavior is more dangerous than the risk of physical restraint. In the trainings that have been provided in the district for the last 10 years for nonviolent crisis intervention, staff are encouraged to determine risk assessment. In other words, to ask themselves, what are the risks of me doing something versus the risks of me doing nothing? My concern with the interpretation of the protection of property and risk assessment can be highlighted in a following example. A teacher brings his or her favorite lamp or any other personal item to the classroom. What happens when a student who is clearly dysregulated or frustrated picks up that lamp or personal item and gestures to break it? Is this solution restraint or no restraint? What message do we really want to send our staff? Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next up is Dan, Dan Wilson. Good evening, my name is Dan Wilson, 3753 Patton Street, Eau Claire, 54701. Tonight I'd like to just briefly talk about employee, specifically teacher compensation. We have many teachers that have been frozen for multiple years, as you well know. And one example is a teacher hired in 2008, has seven years experience, is stuck at pay scale level three. The same as someone coming in with three years experience would get. This freeze has limited the earning potential for this employee and many others, not only for the past few years, but for the rest of their career. This freeze lasts more than a few years. This lasts the career, as I just said. And unless we recognize the experience and expertise these people bring to ECA ECASD, this career will most likely end in a district other than ours. We cannot afford to lose this experience and expertise. So I ask that you look at all possibilities to find a way to move our staff forward, not just sideways. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your comments, Dan. OK, uh, those are the uh, part of the public forum. We're done. Uh, superintendent's report, go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, good evening, everyone. The first thing I'd like to do is to review the upcoming Board of Education events. Starting with tomorrow, there had been a public hearing um, 
for the task force on urban education which is chaired by representative rodriguez that hearing has been canceled and postponed um, and a new date is being sought possibly at the end of february or the beginning of march so as soon as we get that information we will uh, post uh, the new dates and the new tours which will still take place at north star and lakeshore uh, starting tomorrow, February 2nd, from 4 to 8 p.m., uh, the compensation committees will begin working, and uh, tomorrow's uh, the hourly group, and they will be working with the facilitator. On February 3rd, from 8 to 10 a.m., the non-affiliated group will work with the facilitator. And on February 8th, from 4 to 8 p.m., the certified group will work with the facilitator. And all of those meetings will be held here at the administration building. On February 4th from 4 to 5.30 p.m. is the Gifted Advisory Committee meeting and that will be held here in the Administration Building. On February 8th, the Parent Advisory Council will meet and that meeting will take place at 7 p.m. here in the Admin Building. February 9th, the Charter Choice Committee is meeting at 4 p.m. in the Administration Building. And on February 15th, Policy and Governance Committee will meet at 10.30 a.m. Uh, and that meeting will be followed later in the day uh, by a school board meeting uh, at 7 p.m. here in the administration building. Uh, I do want to call the board's attention to the fact that there will be a legislative breakfast and it's being hosted by the Chippewa Falls School Board and that will take place on February 22nd at 7.30 a.m. at the Avalon Hotel and Conference Center in Chippewa Falls. This week is National School Counseling Week, and so we congratulate and honor our counselors this week. And next week is the School Bus Driver Appreciation Week. Tonight we have um, a couple of people to recognize, and we want to start uh, by recognizing Karen Itzo. So Karen, if you would stand, I think you're still in the back there somewhere. Um, and so uh, we are recognizing you tonight for your leadership with nonviolent uh, crisis intervention. Uh, Karen has been um, the one constant team member on the training team for the district um, that began, that team began in 2006. And she began with that team and she continues with that team despite other members rotating in and out. Um, I think you heard a little bit of her concern and passion tonight for that nonviolent crisis intervention. And Karen's approach has been to um, take the position that you really can't force individuals to behave. Um, and that we have to understand that our response as adults can strengthen maintain or in some cases damage a relationship with a student and so with a team approach to uh, crisis intervention we increase the care the welfare safety and security of everyone involved i think since 2006 there have been over 800 people who have been trained in nonviolent crisis intervention and karen has had a big part in all of that training so karen thank you thank you We also have tonight uh, congratulations that are going out to DeLong Middle School Teacher and to, uh, 2013 Wisconsin Middle School Teacher of the Year, Amy Trainer. Um, since Amy received that distinction of being Teacher of the Year in 2013, she's uh, participated in several vision and planning meetings with the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. And through this experience, um, she's not only increased her expertise in the area of instructional leadership, she's been recognized across the state as being an instructional leader. And she shares those, uh, that knowledge not only in the state, but also in the district and at her school. Um, this past month, State Superintendent Tony Evers invited Amy to accompany him as the Wisconsin representative to the first United States Summit on Teacher Leadership in Washington, D.C. And she will participate in several meetings regarding increasing, promoting, and coaching teacher leadership. 
and this event will be held on the 5th and 6th of February. It's a special, very special honor to be selected for this role. So we congratulate Amy. And And in that vein, go on to uh, also recognize other DeLong team members. Um, and I, I really would like to tonight congratulate the DeLong school community for being recognized as a school of promising practices. This recognition went out to only 19 schools in the state for demonstrating high reading achievement growth for students with disabilities. The Department of Public Instruction recently conducted a rigorous review of data based on numerous statistical, geographic, and demographic factors. A select number of schools were identified as having both excellence in a single category and above average growth in other categories, as well as average or above average reading growth for general education students. Representatives from these schools have been invited to participate in a statewide work group to develop resources and materials to share promising practices that have contributed to growth and reading achievement for students with disabilities. And I would like to extend a special thank you to two staff members who will be representing DeLong in this partnership. They are seventh grade social studies teacher, Mr. Brent Watke. Where are you, Brent? There, in the back. And, and seventh grade learning disability teacher, Ms. Nicole Sturgis. Nicole, there um, And I think um, what makes this recognition special is that it is a reflection on the entire DeLong community. It is a team effort. Um, and so we congratulate you. And as Dr. O'Leary would say, it's a great day to be a knight. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you. All right, the uh, President's Report, uh, I have nothing to say tonight, so <laughs> no, no announcements from my end. Right now. <laughs> right now, yeah. <laughs> We're going to try to make it a shorter meeting. All right, um, student reps, uh, who would like to go first, Jason or Emily? J Emily? Okay, go ahead. Um, so I have some exciting news from North. Um, this weekend we had our first forensics tournament. It was a statewide competition at, at in Appleton, and um, of the forensics team placed fourth overall as a team. And out of the 21 kids who were competing, nine of them were able to place. And I kind of feel like they deserve their names to be out there because they've been working their butts off all year. Um, so, like, Jean Zhang um, got fifth place in her category, Haley Stowell got sixth, Christine Blout got fifth, Destiny Erdman got third, Min Olsen got third, Kate Naples got third, Max Haslow got sixth, Retta Isaacson got sixth, and Chelsea Ennin got so sixth, and they just did an awesome job, and it's their first competition of the year, and they're very excited for the, competition, the competitions ahead. Um, musical audition started this week, today and tomorrow, for Beauty and the Beast, which will be in April. So that's exciting. We get to figure out who all is going to be what part. Um, and Winter Carnival was this weekend, and it was really fun and really great. Great. Thank you, Emily. Thanks. Uh, congrats to Forensics, too. Uh, Jason. We had our Winter Carnival um, last weekend, and um, it was casino night. That was the theme. And um, a lot of the students had a lot of fun. And it was very much thematic. That's what they told us. <laughs> and there, there was also an All City Invitational Orchestra concert last weekend as well. And um, the juniors will be taking their ACT on March 1st. So um, I think they better be preparing. <laughs> um, there's also a jazz concert going on tonight, actually, at 7 o'clock. Um, and my last thing is there will be a Winterfest competition, which is a show choir competition. Memorial Show Choir will be competing on February 6th, and it will be at the Memorial Auditorium. Thank you, Jason. And if I understand it right, that's most of the day, right? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Yeah, it's great. It's really good. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're at board committee reports. Um, I know we have a policy and governance. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Commissioner Luganville is going to do that. 
Yeah, we met this morning. We had Steve Weld with us, our attorney, um, to go over policies 221 and 225 regarding the appointment and evaluation of the superintendent. At our next meeting, we're going to be looking at our uh, board member vacancy policy once again. We're going to be talking about revisions and possible a new uh, wellness and nutrition policy and work around that. Um, and looking at our board committee structure, which is policy 185. And then if we time, we'll uh, work on administrative contracts, and that's 222. And then just a reminder for agenda setting, we'd sent revisions adding transgender students to policy 411 to be a committee report at our February 15th board meeting. Great, thank you. Uh, budget, uh, Commissioner Zhang. Yes, we met on the 29th. Um, we went over our allotted time and couldn't finish everything, but we squeezed in as much as we can. We went over the uh, audit report from Clifton, Larson, and Allen. Uh, the opinion that we got back was unmodified, which means that we are doing very good. That's the highest you can get. So kudos to the district and Abby for helping out. Uh, we went over uh, community survey information to see if we would like to get more information from the community via a third party. Um, that, in turn, is going to affect our timeline, which uh, President Spender will be covering uh, later. And then we got some reading materials about uh, preparations for buildings uh, and for rentals. And that is all I got. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know, do we have a do we have a charter committee meeting since the last one? Yeah. Okay. A uh, foundation. Uh, do we have that, Commissioner Duex? I forgot to prepare this, but we had a meeting um, last Tuesday for the. Eau Claire Public Schools Foundation. Uh, we gave several reports like who was getting grants for this semester and we always are happy to read those because there's some very innovative uh, projects that are going on in the district and it's fun to give a little money to those projects. Um, can you think of anything else, Marianne, that we did? Yeah, we discuss we discuss the referendum with the board. So I think I think it was a valuable meeting. Okay, great, thank you. All right, Commissioner Ambach Boyle, legislative update. Um, good evening, everyone. I um, I'm trying to get on the WASB website for the legislative update, and it is not allowing me to do that. So I'm just going to go through what I brought along. I can't be specific from the website. Um, I just, uh, we went to the Educating Hearts and Minds Wisconsin State Education Convention of which I was a delegate and I talked about that at our last board meeting. Um, there were 16 resolutions that, or 15 resolutions that were brought to the floor and debated. Um, I'm not going to get into them specifically. There are, I gave you all a copy as board members so you can see how um, the vote went. All of them passed. Um, not without some debate. The ones that had most debate were the ones that we talked about in more depth as well. One of them was the elimination and the reduction of the newspaper notice um, that did pass, but it was, um, there was debate using the word allowing district so that we could still, still use the newspaper, not necessarily be dictated that we could not do that. The one that had the, um, the other one that had the most debate on the floor was the mental health supports resolution. Um, this goes along with what Karen was talking to um, about as well. Um, first, the floor amended the mental health supports to behavioral supports, and then it went back to mental health supports through a great debate. Um, and it was interesting to find out what other districts are doing across the state relative to the mental health piece. I know we are too within our schools. Um, Hortonville was interesting to me because they've initiated a comprehensive mental health services and they are designated a licensed mental health clinic now. So, um, and a lot of that had to do with the surveys they did to assess their middle and high school students relative to their mental health needs. Um, the last resolution on prevailing wage did not pass and that was the only one that didn't. Um, there was much debate on the floor relative to um, the 15 to 20 percent added cost if using the prevailing wage. Um, Hudson um, has uh, a referendum on the horizon 
uh, a large construction referendum coming up and so they um, stood in opposition as did many other districts that are struggling with their budgets. Um, the other side to that conversation on the floor was that um, many debated that being forced to go with the lowest bid or the lowest cost was not always necessary what's best for schools and I think that that's what we will grapple with as we go down the road. So um, that failed 134 to 167, but um, these are floating around so you can see the actual votes. The other thing I did pick up um, was the charter aid de deduction, the 2015-16 deduction from full equal equalization charter aid de deduction. And these are floating around the room as well and I gave each board member a copy so that you can see what each di district deduction is relative to supporting um, um, the charter schools, uh, most of these that are operating in Milwaukee. So I just wanted to provide that as well. The other legislative piece that I'll get in and provide for you next time, I can't pull it up, I've tried like 20 times sitting here, is there is um, legislation now out of the Assembly and the Senate to redo the um, state scholarship that each high school would receive. Um, they And they're upping the ACT score, which would, um, leave out some of the rural school districts because it's really each school district does get one of those scholarships. If they didn't meet a certain ACT requirement, that school district would no longer be. So I will get that information and send it to you in an email because I thought that was kind of an important one. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, the WASB, so when we get to the WASB on the agenda, you don't have to redescribe them now. <laughs> <laughs> WASB dot. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, um, okay, great. So next on our agenda is the uh, consent agenda. Uh, for the consent agenda, these are generally items we've discussed before uh, or are routine and um, we'll vote on all at once unless a board member decides to pull one. So uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of December 21st, 2015. Pull. Pull. Okay, so we have that pull. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of January 18th, 2016. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of closed session January 18th, 2016. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the closed session on January 25th, 2016. I would entertain a motion to approve the Human Resources Employment Report. And I would entertain a motion to approve the, to adopt the new policy 342.7, Services and Programs for English Learners. And I would entertain a motion to approve the revisions to policy 447.1, Staff Use of Physical Force slash Restraint and Seclusion. Pull that on, please. Okay, so we have a poll for that. Okay, uh, so I want to entertain a motion for all except the first and the last. I so move. I have a motion, Commissioner Duax. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second from Commissioner Zhang. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, so first, the minutes of 21st, 2015, I think uh, Commissioner Johnson or Commissioner Luganville, oh. whichever. So <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll go ahead and discuss. Um, I believe it's page six. It's just um, it's a, the um, discussion on compensation, just above the charter school annual report. Um, there was public comments by Mark Goings, and then there is a paragraph that starts board members agreed. I would like to suggest an amendment that a majority of board members agreed. So adding a majority of prior to th that sentence. So this was, me, so this is under committee yep. uh, report. So we don't even have a vote ever in that anyhow. Um, so let's see, I see under public comments piece, yep. board, it says board members agreed they would not go to referendum without the compensation yep. piece. So uh, I would say, and since there's not a vote, it's just a discussion, but you want to amend it to say uh, a majority, majority of. of board members agreed. So the first thing I would like is a motion to put this on the table, just the just the minutes. Could I have a motion for that? So moved. Motion from Commissioner Johnson, a second? Second. Second, Commissioner Duak. So we have the minutes on the table. So would you like to make that amendment, Commissioner Johnson? I do. Okay, so we have an amendment to modify board members agreed to uh, a majority of board members agreed that they would not go to. So we have a motion from Commissioner Johnson for that change. Do I have a second? A second. I have a second from Commissioner Jean. Other discussion, disagreements on that? Okay, all those in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed?
motion passes. Uh, now I would like, uh, an, oh, I'm sorry, now I'll call the main motion for the oh, minutes. Oh, did you have other comments? Excuse me, sorry, go ahead. Just a typo. The name of the teacher that, he's the first National Board Certified Band Director in the history of this district. Mm -hmm. His last name is B-O-L-L, Bull. Okay. So that's it's, under, it's under superintendent's report. As under, oh, okay, under superintendent's report. So, okay, so. so we should spell it right. <laughs> Good catch. Okay. I don't think it needs a motion. Uh, we'll just make that as a correction. I won't make an amendment for that. B-O-L-L, -L. okay? All right, so all those in favor of the amended minutes, all those in favor say aye. Opposed? Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Uh, so the other uh, polled item was revisions of policy 447.1. I don't remember. Was that Commissioner Hambuck Boyle? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, do you think we should pull it back into committee after comments made this evening? Uh, comments on that question. Commissioner Luganville, did you have a, Oh. Well, it's up to you, Commissioner Johnson. Well, the members of the committee, did you discuss that um, particular phrase that's what well, there was concern? Should, no. we, should we get to the phrase that's mentioned? Is that your issue? So why don't we uh, find out which phrase it is? Do you remember which one it is? For the protection of property, it's the fourth bullet. Fourth bullet. Okay, so under um, policy 447.1, as it is under con uh, consent yeah. agenda, it says, for the protection of property. So board comments on that. Do you want it to uh, be sent back to committee? So we could entertain a motion to send it back to committee, entertain a motion to approve. You could do an amendment if you thought it was easy enough. We, so, so multiple options. You could do an amendment to, to correct it or change it. You could do an amendment to send it back to committee. Would Karen, would you question. be willing to come up and? She cannot afford this part. Oh, go ahead, Jim. I, I wasn't sure. I know Robin had brought this to policy and governance, and I, she saw I was sick this evening. Um, the statute does state, and, and I, I think Karen um, has, is, is rightfully concerned, but the, sta the statute does state the property piece in there. Um, and so I think that the document is reflective of that. And when I asked Robin about this, that's, and Karen reflected that in her comments about the importance of the rules that will follow. Um, but I think if the committee wants to review it again and look at the statute again, I don't think that there's a rush. So. I think if, it depends on if the committee wants to take it back after all the ones you have. If, if you think it reflects statute as it should and it can be fixed in the rules, we could move forward. If you think you need to review it and maybe change it, then we would send it back. Commissioner Ambuck Boyle. I don't mind taking care of it in the rules and putting the emphasis on how people are trained within that process and that we're, as a board, very aware of that, then that's fine. But I'm. I'm glad to bring it up to make sure that it does happen in the rules. Okay. Others? I was just going to ask, okay. do you know which of the statutes referenced that it that? Comes yep, from? it's uh, 118. Just a moment here. Uh, and I actually, it's it's cited in the uh, WASB policy resource guide. It's 118.31 parenthesis four. Um, and then in that, it has a reference to sub three. And if you click to that, it'll bring you to the list which ironically is under corporal punishment but it is a list of the items that um that it do, are allowed um in there so i can i can send you the link if you'd like okay yeah okay good i'll give commissioner johnson a chance to read it other other comments i, I would johnson. propose that we not revise it because it literally the bullet points match the statute so we so if if you want don't if you want it don't want to send it back to committee I would accept a motion to approve this. Is what so I moved. Second. I have, uh, so I have a motion from Commissioner Luganville, a second from Commissioner Hambuck Boyle to uh, approve this. Comments, questions, concerns. Okay, I will call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Oppose. Motion passes. And so this is with the understanding that we'll make sure it's clear in the rules uh, about the concerns. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so we have one individually considered resolution tonight, and that is the timeline. Um, this had come to us uh, once before to review and budget, uh, well, at least to budget, uh, and um, budget has reviewed it and given feedback um, to administration on it. Um, I would say there is one piece which um, Commissioner uh, 
Zhang mentioned is uh, that the board should particularly look at is in the part about the timeline from January 6th to May 5th of 2016. Um, there is that piece about uh, issuing an RFP for a survey to assess community preference and input about school district needs with a target date for survey results of April 2016. So the idea here that's proposed by administration is, uh, which a number of other districts have used when going to referendum, is to do a survey of the community, not, not just really to see if they would approve a referendum, but partially to educate them on uh, pieces of what could be in a referendum, but also to get feedback on feelings and various issues related to that. Is that a good summary? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we wanted, uh, I wanted to make sure that was in there. So if you approve this, it would approve issuing an RFP. Now, RFPs would come back to us to approve ultimately end, and we'd have to look at the cost of those, but it would indicate some commitment to an RFP uh, to, to that process, if, and we'd see what it looked like. Commissioner Luganville. What kind of a ball, ballpark cost did the other districts? Well, <laughs> yeah, Abby <laughs> doesn't want to um, realize when she talks about this, there are districts of different sizes and so forth, so it's a little hard to tell, but go ahead. I'm not going to give you exact ranges because it's all over the board. Um, it's very dependent upon what assistance do we want from the community surveys. I can tell you when La Crosse did theirs, probably the first time they went for operating referendum, um, their business manager indicated about 15,000. But that included mailings and it wasn't, you know, it was all encompassing. Some other things that I've seen is depending on how you want them to analyze the data, if you want them to do additional follow up after that. There's all kinds of things and ranges, but I think it really, it's hard to put a number out there because I just don't really know exactly what kind of services we want. And there's many companies that do this. And so, you know, their fees are all different. Um, I can tell you our purchasing manager looked into Fond du Lac's proposal because they did one recently and they had nine companies respond to their RFP and they had to sit and actually go through them one by one because it's not apples to apples between each company. So. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Welcome. thank you. And I think in, in budget we had discussed having, and I think um, the superintendent proposed this, um, having um, you know two board members and different staff members on a subcommittee to review the RFPs and, and make a recommendation to the board when they come. I think that, that hopefully that summarizes what we're thinking about. Yeah. And um, issuing an RFP does not necessarily mean that you're going to go forward with it, you, but you have to get some kind of idea of the scope of the work that you want and also, as well as the cost. Yes, agreed. It does, I think it does indicate some seriousness that you don't want to go for RFPs and, companies know you're not really going <laughs> to consider seriously. So, you know, we're serious about it still. Uh, Commissioner Ambuck Boyle. I, I um, appreciate having this timeline. I think it's good for us to work off of it and amend it. Um, when I looked through it and noticed a fact sheet draft um, May through August of 2016, um, I know that we are meeting with parent groups, staff members, whatever, prior to that in our strategic plan, I guess it's in my mind those fact sheets, we should start working on those now. Um, they could be amended over time depending, but I think we need, we need that information now as we are out in the community as board members and connecting with people relative to our budget, to the impact of vouchers, um, all those pieces that we could probably be putting together now as opposed to waiting till May and I just wanted to bring that up. Um, so I think it's in the, the name of the sheet. Um, a fact sheet is a very specific strategy where you list your needs, you list the question, and you list the impact on the taxpayer. That would have to be done after you had determined your question and what your needs were and that kind of thing. You could do an information sheet or okay. information, you know, blurb where you're talking about some of the discussion that you've already okay. had. And we, we did a little bit we of did. that in the uh, public forums where we gave, um, you know, attendees and others uh, facts about how much we pay for vouchers, how much we, you know, uh, how much of our deficit was and how we came to that deficit. So I think it's just, it's just in the wording. Okay. So, so we can start working on those now. Yeah. All right. So, Commissioner Hammock Boyle, would you like to add a bullet on the January 6th through May 5th to just put a bullet of information sheets? Mm -hmm. 
to okay. start making the so information we, sheet. Okay, so when we get uh, this on a motion on the floor, you can make that amendment if you wish. Other questions about the timeline comments? Okay, okay, in budget, we've looked at it a couple of times already, so. Okay, so I would uh, entertain a motion to approve this timeline. So moved. I have a motion for Commissioner Sorry. Vu. I have a, a second from Commissioner Duax. Would you like to make that amendment? I'd like to amend the addition of information sheets um, being compiled relative to our needs and the community needs starting as soon as possible. Okay, so I'll just, I think in, in, in the sh on the sheet, we'll just write information sheets Perfect. if that's okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and then we can be more specific about what those yeah. are going to be. The administration yep. can decide yep. what those will be. Okay. Do I have a second to that amendment? A second. Second. A second from Commissioner Jean. Any discussion about that amendment? Okay, all those in favor of the amendment to add information sheets to the January 6th through May 5th piece? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so we have a timeline with that amendment. Any other discussion? Okay, all those in favor of approving this timeline as amended? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, uh, administration and the superintendent, for all the work on this. Um, hopefully it will help us move forward. All right, so we now have a committee report on calendar and start time implementation. So the calendar, uh, the, especially the start time committee in conjunction sometimes with the calendar committee has been working on start times. Um, so we have a report on that and try to get some feedback from the board. So we'll give them a chance. I assume uh, we have a PowerPoint or something on that. Yes? Yeah. I feel so far away. Um, so I'm going to start the presentation. Patty, could you find the PowerPoint for the guys? <laughs> Thanks. Um, rather than doing a lot of flip-flop around with a cast of thousands, I think is what Dr. Hardebeck refers to it as when there's multiple people up at the podium to do a presentation. Um, I'm going to start the presentation from here and then both or James and Dave and Mark will continue on. So Dave, I'm going to need you to push the button. Thanks. So the four of us will be presenting, although, wow, that's really blurry, isn't it? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> exactly. So I don't know if that's, thank you, Mr. Schmidt. There must be a magic button. Off and on. Off and on. <laughs> Otherwise known as the magic button, the power button. If everybody moves to this side of the room, you'll be able to see it clearly right here. <laughs> Crystal clear. have it excellent okay so again I need somebody to push the button the guys got together with me prior to this and decided that I was going to start here and they were going to take control over there and, and I'm not sure that was such a great plan <laughs> so with the start time committee Dave you can go ahead with the next one um, we have a, a joint committee between the calendar committee and the start time committee and that happened as a result of the start time committee presenting to the board in November and coming into some barriers in terms of the implementation for the start time committee work and so at that point in time the board indicated that we should bring start time and calendar together to look to find out um, how those two initiatives could work together to get what we need on that research based research based um, education that we're looking to present to the to the community so you can see the original list of calendar committee members um, this is the group who worked for several years to create the calendar that calendar that we're currently living in um, 
you can see it's a multitude of people representing all different areas of the district and this is the original calendar committee that did the work that reflects the calendar we currently have next slide Dave thank you so the start time committee this is obviously new based upon the direction from the board and as you can see from the different um, areas that these individuals represent we're talking about um, community members parents district representatives um, anybody who somehow has a partnership with the district that could be affected by a change in start times and so the makeup of this committee was determined by the board and all of the people on both the start time and the, and the calendar committee have worked very hard and diligently in the past many months to get us to the point that we're at tonight where you'll see the progress that's been made since we came to you back in November so again the work of the both the combined combined groups um, start time met on their own to start their work back in September and then again presented to the board in November at which point the director was given to be able to combine the work of both groups and we've had three joint meetings since that point in time with the last one being January 12th some of the work that was done within those within those two committees coming together was um, the fact that we conducted a staff survey regarding the current calendar the 1516 calendar we wanted to get some feedback on where um, people thought we were at with that even though we hadn't gone through an entire cycle uh, we needed to make recommendations for the 1617 calendar and wanted to get as much feedback back as we could you'll see the results of that feedback um, Dave's going to share that in a minute but um, at the end of the school year we plan to go back and survey the group again because now they would have lived through an entire school year calendar and had an experience that they didn't have when we surveyed back in December and again at the end of the school year we also plan to solicit parent feedback and so all of that feedback that's yet to come will help us to build the 1718 calendar to see if there's any tweaks that need to be made once staff and family and communities have been able to live through the calendar for one full cycle and so now Dave's going to talk about that information that we surveyed folks on. All right, thanks, Kay. <clears throat> so what we have here is feedback from all the buildings collective, and you can see that the first slide talks about the five days of staff professional development um, that was embedded into the calendar, which is different for 1516, for classroom preparation uh, preceding the uh, first day that we have students present. So green is good blue is pretty good and yellow is some wonderments and you can see from bottom to top teacher work time in the classroom was universally um, supported 94% of our staff indicated that being very helpful <clears throat> we could hand out dollar bills in our staff and not get 94% <laughs> feedback as affirming as this um, building led school improvement planning if you combine what somewhat helpful and very helpful you'll see 89% of staff that participated in the survey indicated um, affirmation to that initiative building led professional development again you've got 92 percent of staff um, that responded indicating affirmative to that uh, district led professional development um, 80 percent of staff being supportive of that and wellness activities 75 percent so again that is feedback on those first five days we have five days of embedded time preceding student arrival um, I can tell you now with a different hat on it's principal Memorial High School <clears throat> we were able to take a full day before the start of the school year and talk about specifically our SIP our SIP plan for the year our school improvement plan and be able to purposely spend time both with our leadership teams but at a department level talking about how they can our staff can actualize um, activities in their classroom to directly tie to the SIP through educator effectiveness SLO tools that we have PPGs things of that nature so we are able to spend time purposely to actualize actions in the classroom that tie directly to our school improvement plan and that is this calendar is a derivative or a conduit to allow that to occur next slide here you can see that we had some professional development in October one or two days depending on the building that you're at and you can see again that 78 percent of staff indicated that that was affirming in their uh, their view of the time then we also had some instructional planning time in in October as well PD remember is time that is going to occur at a department level or greater building initiatives um, whatever combination every building has different governance structure IP time is at a department level or course level or a team time team level 
and then smaller into a derivative of that. Class, um, learning targets at the high school, middle school, um, building common informative and summative um, assessments, and then analyzing the data from those assessments, some of the work that happens there. And then you can see here that um, staff is giving us 94% uh, feedback that indicates somewhat or very helpful. And then the next slide here, um, feedback from um, all stakeholders across the, the bands here. Um, their feedback looks like instructional planning in the afternoon. We had Mondays and Tuesday before the break, sorry, uh, in November. That the instructional planning in the afternoons, very helpful. Typically our P, IP times after after the lunch break with PD time in the morning, IP in the afternoon, rather to say it the correct way. But opportunities for teachers to have that work time and then to professionally develop with their colleagues and then meet in instructional level planning and work with the different um, leadership teams throughout the buildings, all, again, affirmative in the data that we have here. So, yeah, if it, one thought we have for the board, a recommendation for the board, would be to carry um, the PDIP plan forward in future calendars, at least in some derivative based on the, the data that we've been able to gather from staff thus far. We'll continue to do this as we move through the second semester and then of course poll our parents as well but at least initially our recommendation is from what the staff tells us that this is a, a welcome initiative or reform to the to the calendar previous to previous years can i can i ask, can, I ask, a, well, can I ask a question go ahead yes. when you absolutely dave when you combined the somewhat helpful with the very helpful did you ask for the people who rated it somewhat helpful what would make it very helpful sure Chris at Memorial so we have a little bit more of a scalpel of a exit ticket than we would with uh, you know across all the buildings and what staff there tells us is Dave give us more instructional planning time and maybe just a little bit less building directive PD give a you've given us the charge right the the school improvement plan you have got want learning target work, you want instructional practices to be honed, you want um, formative and, and, and summative assessments to be drafted, reformed, and then analyze the data. Give us that. You'll hear less initiative and then more deep in the initiatives that we have. Right. Other questions before James works his magic? Good evening, James Martin, uh, your Director of Technology, and uh, I have the uh, opportunity here to share with you the details and specifics of the calendar. There should be enough for almost everyone. I might have been short, too, so um, when we get to the ends, perhaps there's a little sharing that goes on. Um, one thing to, to highlight, uh, Commissioner Hamak Boyle, on that was there were some open-ended questions with that survey, and K-12 Insight handled that for us. and. We expect to have the thematic analysis of those open-ended surveys back in about two weeks. So we'll have a little bit more information on how to uh, fine-tune and, and parse out what we can improve going forward from that also. So the calendar that I've put in, that, I, that I've handed out is, um, as uh, we, we've mentioned uh, was the theme here, is we're kind of trying to live through what we've already had for a year. And to do that, we met with, um, We'll zoom in to get some clarity here for everyone. Um, we met with the calendar team again, the calendar committee, and, and spent a, a good amount of time talking through some pros and cons uh, of each each month and each configuration throughout uh, each day that is that has been called out for something unique happening. And um, as we went through things, there were a few things we tweaked, but by and large, uh, there was a, a consensus among the group, a, a commitment to live through the first calendar, this first time of us having this many PD and IP and work days pulled out uh, and where they're strategically placed, to live through that process once first. So although we have the survey data that we just reviewed and we met as a committee, there was still a recognition that as we were developing this, we were still in the months of uh, November, December, and, and even early, early January, 
and still understanding how this is going to either either work better for us or th what the challenges might be. So as I go through this, if it sounds very, very similar, um, that's because it is with a few tweaks. So if I may, I'll just really quick walk through the months. In August, uh, you can see that this proposed calendar starts out with uh, five days again before five contract days of our teaching staff before the students arrive. Um, and those are a mix of uh, work days and the PDIP days that we just saw some survey data and on. Then our first day of, uh, with students is September 1st, and that is a legislation uh, detail that causes that date to be September 1st. And we have our first day off uh, closed of in the entire district on Labor Day, and that's the highlight of September. In October, uh, again, very similar this past October, we have um, October 14th. This is one of the modifications. In this current calendar that we're living, October 14th, we actually had high schools in session, and our middle school and our elementary were um, off for some PDIP time. And that was compared to October 27th of the current schedule, where we actually had um, high school off, and we had uh, conferences scheduled for our middle school and our elementary. So that was the current year. This year, after reflecting on it and living through the month of October when we discussed this, um, the tweak is that on October 14th, that second Friday in October, collectively across the district, we would have a, a pre-K-12 PDIP time. So that is a change from this current year that we're living through. We thought it would be better to, to focus a little bit more on the PDIP that's pre-K-12 we can have some uh, some connections between multiple levels that way, which we can't always do when we when we break out our time. Then you look at the uh, October 25th would be um, a day for middle school conferences in the evening, regular school day with middle school conferences in the evening, and then October 27th is uh, a day when our elementary and middle school students are off, but our staff are all here. High school is in session, so those students are in session, and the elementary and middle school student or or staff are in. Uh, their conferences and the elementary is asked for a 12-hour conference block of time to spend the entire day and your uh, middle school is finishing up eight hours of their conference time on that day they've already done 12 hours on the evening of the 25th afternoon of the 25th of October and then similar to this year the 28th is a it's a day when the entire district would be closed for for schools all schools will be closed and that is uh, again similar to what we just lived through this past October uh, November, um, there's, there are many marking period references on here, but the short of it is we get to that week of Thanksgiving. This is the first time we've had that week of Thanksgiving off uh, for students and had uh, PD and IP time and some work time uh, worked in there. And this would be the same model we'd be looking at for next year with the 21st and 22nd of time for our staff to be in PD and IP or working uh, on assessments. And that's detailed there. Again, the same process that was held this past November. And then in our December month, we have a uh, break there between December and January. And you can see that there's a, a four-day week of instruction leading up to the 23rd of December. And then we return with a four-day week of instruction starting on January 23rd. Again, this amount of time uh, and where these lay are is very similar to the break that we just went through. A little bit of a shortened break. Um, and the shorter the break allows for more days for our AP classes and our AP students to have time in before they hit their AP tests come, uh, come early May. So again, a, a slightly smaller, shorter uh, break at that time. Then at the end of January, uh, we have a model that we've, we've um, used of trying to have a work time for our secondary staff to do their assessments as they close out their semester work. And again, this year, a slight, a slight twist is that on the 24th of January, so that Tuesday, our high school uh, students are, are off. Our high school staff are in session, are in the PD and IP time. So this came out of a request specifically for our high school staff, recognizing that as they transition from one semester coursework to another semester coursework, having a little additional time to reset their courses, look at how the last course went as they close things down and preparing for the next course moving forward and taking some time to do PD, some time to look at the data, some time to prepare moving forward. Um, they've suggested it would be beneficial. We've just lived through that. So at this time, we hadn't experienced this when we kind of put this final piece together. But that's a January. It's, it's more or less identical to this past January that we're just finishing up. February, as you're moving through into February, uh, it mimics a lot what we saw in October. So there is some conference time built in on the 23rd for elementary and middle school. And there is uh, a, 
a day uh, where the entire school is closed. The, all schools are closed on the 24th. And then we have a PDIP time pre-K-12 on the 27th. Again, we haven't experienced this yet, but this is carrying forward what was the work done by the calendar committee in the prior years as, of their brainstorm and their surveys and their um, look at the data for their work. Then we have March. March is looking for aligning our spring break with the university's spring break. So recognizing the value of that partnership and the value add that those students bring to our students, not only in the classroom, but also in many, many student support organizations that occur before school, after school, and through, throughout the school day for that matter with various programming partnerships that we've, we've created. So this aligns with the university spring break. April uh, is something, again, we haven't worked through this yet uh, in this school year, but we do have on that uh, one, there is a, a day set aside in April that would be a possible inclement weather makeup day for all students. So that day, um, both currently as we move forward in this school year and also proposed for next school year, there's this optional day where we intend to have PD and IP time. And we also want to recognize that in the event that there is some uh, significant series of inclement weather days, we also want to really have enough time to ensure that we have a hard stop at the end of the school year. So by having this as an option, we end up having a, a total allocation of additional minutes within a school year of, of up to five days of inclement weather. So this model here where the April 13th would be a, this, this floating day uh, mimics again what we're looking as we move forward through the school year and that's what there and um, the 14th then is a uh, April 14th is known uh, as Good Friday among many groups and is a day that we're su suggesting that this community uh, has re in the past supported having off and it continues to be a day that would be uh, off at this in this calendar pr proposal. We get into May, and in May we have um, May 5th. Now May 5th, uh, that first two weeks of May, is the AP testing for our high school group, something that we're uh, make, trying to make sure we prioritize and create um, time around that's protected. So May 5th is actually a day where high school would still be in session, but your elementary and PD, or your elementary and middle school staff would have opportunities to have their um, PD and their IP time as they start closing down their work and preparing for wrapping up the, uh, the semester, seeing how far they've gotten in their courses and, and looking at what things they need to do to, to finish strong. So that is what May 5th is, and then May 29th is your Memorial Day. And as we look at June, we have uh, the last student day on the 6th, and we have the uh, final staff day on the 7th. And that is whirlwind tour of the calendar. So any specific questions on any of those months or, or feedback for me? Mr. McCoyle. I'm sorry, but I have one question. I, I think that um, you're finding that the, the time spent together in your PLCs and whatever is becoming beneficial. I, as a board member, um, want to know when we will eventually use our calendar as an intrinsic piece for enticing educators to our district because not all districts value that kind of collaboration. I can tell you that I started that last year already um, as we look for ways to kind of recruit people to come to our district. Anything that I can use as a tool in, in that toolbox to say, hey, this is something you're not going to find somewhere else, and this is a big, a big caveat. I think as soon as we have some data as we go through to be able to attach that to the days, I think that'll make it even more substantial. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right, so start time. Now, it was in November, um, as was already mentioned, that was the last time that the start time committee came and presented here. And take a look at our charge again. It is to be research-based. As we mentioned in November, um, there's a tremendous amount of research out there that says that especially our- Mark, Mark, excuse me. Is there a way of zooming in a little bit? I don't know, maybe I'm getting old, but <laughs> I'm having a hard time reading that. Okay. <laughs> Um, that it is to be research-based, um, and the committee looked at many articles, for, like from the American Academy of Pediatrics and others. Um, and as is mentioned again in November, our 
ideally we can find a way for our middle schools and, and high schools to um, start a little bit later. So, all right. Turn it off. Then. Okay. Yep. Okay. And um, <clears throat> and then after the the, the, the November meeting. Um, some of the directives that the board gave was for the start times committee to likely uh, to meet with the calendar committee and see is there some way that we can come up with an ideal um, schedule, ideal system uh, moving forward. And as we look at moving forward, it's a, a good place to start is to look at where we're at. Um, these are the current bell times, start and stop. Um, and a few things I want you to take a look at that um, is, especially as we're like working through the strategic planning um, piece in our district, it's important to, re to re always reflect on the fact that our students are more than just numbers, they're more than just test scores, they're entire people. And so yes, that's the start and finish their day, but they have lives, they have families, they have uh, early bird classes, they have practice in the morning, after school, they have YMCA daycare, so there's a lot of stuff that gets involved in this. And one of the things that the research also said is that the larger the district, the harder uh, start time change can be. And so that's been the greatest challenge. The committee is trying to figure out, okay, with all of these parts and looking at the whole child and the whole family, what is the best solution here? Um, also, in, in looking at this, at our current start times, it's also important to remember um, from a dollars and cents standpoint, a transportation standpoint, this has also evolved over the years to become an efficient transportation system, um, which allows us to, from our busing standpoint, use multiple or use the same bus for multiple routes to serve multiple buildings, which ultimately saves the district dollars. So if you look at our earliest, so if you look at um, the middle schools at 7.30 there, and our last elementaries, there's over an hour of time between those. Um, one of the questions I have oftentimes is, why is it we can't be like Chippewa Falls? Or how is it that Altoona can do this so easily? Um, a few things for you to realize, the time between the elementary and the secondary at Chippewa Falls is 42 minutes. Um, ours, as I'll show you the next slide, we're hoping we can get it in in about an hour. But because the buses, in order to have the turnaround time, and with the volume of buildings we have, it's a more complex um, thing. Now in Altoona, they can do that with a 35 minute difference between the early school and the last school. Um, but also they have a district that's less than 20 square miles, whereas Eau Claire is around 240 square miles. Um, so you have that volume there. So anyway, also as I mentioned in November, this, this um, slide here, we could, could move all the times back. We can move all the back, all of them back 15 minutes, a half hour. Um, when we looked at it in November, uh, moving it back a half hour, the board decided that didn't seem like a good idea because you'd have some elementaries where students could be at the YMCA daycare for a couple hours before education even started. And so that was a concern. But as with anything, we're going to look at some trade off. So, Here's a scenario of what flipping start times could look like. I'll give you a little bit of time to look at that. Um, in, the, um, <clears throat> in the American Academy of Pediatrics, it's mentioned many times that the ideal for secondary is to start um, at 8.30 or later. Uh, and so we have this is an 8.30 time here. Now realize all these times are relative. If we wanted to have everything start a little bit later, we could. Or if you wanted them to start a little earlier, we could do that too. But, um, and so one of the important things though is to look at, um, we're, gonna have, we're gonna need to have approximately seven elementaries that in this scenario would start at 7.30 in order to have middle school start at 8.30 because we need to have that hour turnaround time. That's already less turnaround time than we have currently. All right, so that's gonna be pushing things. Now, 
Um, one of the things that our group is looking at is like, well, which seven elementary schools should that be? Or which, which six elementary schools start at 805? That's one of the things that we would have to look at because we'd have to look at the populations of the individual buildings. Uh, we'd have to look at programs. Are there certain ones that fit better here or there? Um, also, in talk with student transit, um, right now we have five different elementary start times. These, the 730 concept and that 805 concept, those will get tweaked a little bit. Um, so you might have, you know, in that seven elementary school slot, you might have three of those that could start five minutes later than that or ten minutes later than that. But it's going to be, it's going to be a, around that time. <clears throat> also, in elementaries, um, we have a lot of students that have breakfast, which also realize that 7.30 bell time means a 7.15 drop off time in order to have our children come in and have breakfast before they go to lunch, I mean, before they go to class. So anyway, so you can look at that. Again, we could slide it, the whole thing, a little bit later if we wanted to, but then the other, the other thing to look at is for the high schools and middle schools, what time are they getting done? Um, and one of the example is in 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 some of middle middle schools there are multiple practice times. You'll have an early practice time and a later practice time. Um, and so, if you're already having that later practice time and it keeps getting pushed back farther and farther and farther, well, part of the wonderful thing about middle school is being able to experiment with things and just try stuff out. And if it's becoming a burden on a family to start to be dropping a child off too late in the evening or pick them up too late in the evening, that starts to be something we have to look at too. So anyway, this is what a change in start time could look like. Um, now, one of the things we're also looking at is um, how many built-in snow days do we need to have? Um, that's one of the reasons why we also brought the calendar committee um, on board with this. From a historical perspective, you can see, um, you know, even in some of our worst winters, having those four, the four school days closed. Um, and currently, by the way, we have four built-in days, but the fifth one is the optional um, day that we can absorb from our staff development time. So. When we look at, <laughs> all right, so when we came in November, um, the, the flipped time seemed to be the most desirable to, to the board. And the flip time we had at that time took basically our current calendar with our four built-in snow days, with that fifth one there, the n same number of uh, PDIP days. and that was going to cost about $750,000 to transition middle school and high school later. Um, and part of that transition cost is just realize our middle school and high school are, are required to have more minutes than our elementaries do. Um, and so that's one of the things we have to look at is how the days from the different groups line up. Um, $750,000 seemed high, I think, by everyone's um, imagination. So we looked at, as a committee, what are some things we could do about this? And as a committee, if we're going to split, uh, switch start times, this is one that we looked at quite a bit. One of the things, the main thing here is um, to reduce the middle school time, school day by four minutes, and the high school by five minutes. Um, that $750,000 price tag went down to approximately $380,000. So by absorbing those minutes in the day, um, we saved over half of that original cost. Now, the, where those came from is, again, right now we have four fully built-in days. This would mean two, we'd have two fully built-in days. And it's also important to remind people that now that we're on a minute system, if we have a late start sometime or an early dismissal, those count on minutes. Um, so that's one thing that we have to consider and think about how we're going to handle those. <coughs> now, our next one, I can flip back to these if we need to. This next one, um, after, 
after we looked at the three hundred eighty thousand um, dollar concept with uh, two uh, with absorption to two days, um, that was the last one, by the way, that the the start time calendar committee the, in, the, in the large sense looked at it. Um, after we uh, met at this the committee, there's also a few more. There's a board inquiry, and we looked at what would happen if we absorbed two more days. Um, and that gets us to the nine to ten minutes because one of the things to realize is the more that we can the more that we can shorten the middle school high school day, the more efficient our bus system gets, which ultimately saves us dollars. And so one of the one of the jobs of the board is is to look at you know at what point have we hit the ideal efficiency because keep in mind again. We're looking at children and their lives in the large sense, and we have to make those help make those quality decisions. So one way we could do this is we could get that original seven hundred fifty thousand dollar ticket down to two hundred eighty thousand dollars approximately um, by shaving nine to ten minutes off the middle school high school day, and that would still um, absorb two of the snow days, and then the. The main difference, the other difference here is going from, from staff, from a staff standpoint, going from 189 days to 191. And then from the student instruction day, it adds two at each level. So elementary, we go from 170 to 172, middle school 170 to 172, and high school 172 to 174. Um, and then um, on the bottom line there, to increase contracts, um, the number of contract days is approximately $300,000 per day when you add up district-wide. Um, and so that would add $600,000 um, would be the additional cost of those instructional days from a staffing standpoint. Now, from a transportation standpoint, it does come down. And that was one of the questions that the board had last time was, if it's going to cost, would it make more sense to cost to move the cost from transportation to staffing. And so that's, that's what this could look like. Um, the next slide. I'm Keep sorry, go, can you go back? So it's a 280. Plus 600,000, so that'd be uh, 880,000. That, bas that was basically my question there, full disclosure. Was that, you know, if we added two days, how much would it reduce bus costs, and yes. how much would the staffing increase? That that was right. my question. Thank you. Uh, um, so the how did I guess how did you figure the staffing increase? Because right now um, teachers are salaried, so you're so. How did you figure that? I'll let Kay address that one. We looked at the cost of um, <coughs> all certified and classified staff who wouldn't normally be on contract and. Um, figured out what their wages were and then multiplied it by two. So if, say, a teacher base salary is 40000 the base salary would go up by like 40000 divided by 189, 40000 plus two. Plus two. Yep, we took their per diem for each day and added and is, it. Is there, um, is there any reason why we would be required to do that? This goes back to your other comment last time about just adding days and not compensating people. Technically, you can create a contract for however many days you want and provide whatever wage you want. I mean, there isn't anything legally. Again, it would just go to morale and implementation of adding work days and no additional compensation. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. All right. So our next slide is going to try to keep the 9 to 10 minutes concept. Um, but look at it, uh, look at how we get those, those days differently. Um, and so in this one, rather than having the teacher contract go from 189 to 191, it stays at 189. Um, the main difference here, in order to pick up those two additional days, is the middle school and high school will um, change two of their IPPD days and that would become um, student contact days. Um, and again, this one was also for, for, from the board inquiry, and it was 
um, Kay, James, Dave, and I look, uh, brainstorming what those other two days could look like. Um, so this is another possible solution. Um, now I know that the board has also wondered uh, what would a zero or a close to zero cost difference be? And one of the things I hope you realize, I hope you see is going back to that 380,000, that kept the IPPD days the same and just reduced student time by the four to five minutes to high school. If we want to get down to close to a zero, um, a court, uh, um, and student, and this is a rough estimate. Um, student transit estimates estimates that we'd have to reduce middle school and high school by 17 to 18 minutes a day, um, which would, if you look at the days there, um, would change the 170. What they'd, they'd be going up by six. Um, I'm sorry, going up for, from that slide, going up by four more. So middle school would be at 176, and high school would be at 178. Technically, we could decide, since elementary has more minutes because of DPI requirements than they already need anyway, that could stay at 170. Uh, that would be a decision we'd have to look at from the board. Uh, just to clarify what you just said, so you're saying if we had that many instructional days, then transportation costs wouldn't change? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? If we, if you look at the slide as it is, if middle school went up to 176 and high school went to 178, that would give enough. That would be the 17 to 18 minutes. Uh, so that's kind that of the breaking up. point to get. But that would also mean either we'd go back to the previous slide and are you, do we pay staff for the four additional days, or that would be all four of the remaining IPPD days that are on this slide. Uh, could I ask one other question? Um, on uh, this one, so just, just to summarize what it really means is it means if we basically removed uh, the two um, instructional days at the secondary level and converted them, uh, I'm sorry, removed them as um, professional development days and made them instructional days, then you've got those two days is what yes. you're saying. Okay, just and so that also, that the, again, the Clement Weather Day, that's already gone That's down already in there, yep. right, that's already in there. So that's where you'd get the two days, basically. So basically, okay. if you look at, compare this slide, um, 189 um, total contract days, the $280,000 cost, and look at the number of student instruction days with the first, with this one, basically you're looking at four to five minutes at 300,000 or nine to 10 minutes at $280,000 <clears> additional cost. So. Gotcha, I, I think I understand. Board members have questions on any, are you ready for questions or do you have more to discuss first before you um, want questions or? Um, Dave's gonna talk a little bit about, uh, more about the staff development side and implementation. If you know, if it's a more of that end, we can wait. Otherwise I can take questions about this part. Maybe if there's specific questions about these specific options, just to clarify, right, like sure. I asked, we could do that before we discuss the pros and cons of them. Uh, Commissioner Luganville. I know the last time you had a presentation, you had bell schedule slides as examples. Do you have those in this presentation coming of up? Of other places? The, or uh, of, uh, of what we would do here or of their other schools? Of the options here. Um, the first. This one is based, these times are based off of that four to, shaving four to five minutes. Okay. Now if we did shave the nine to ten minutes, we would just, we would just lop them off this. You know, we can decide that we want to shift it off the beginning, off the end, but um, essentially anything would be predicated off of this slide. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Ann McBoyle. Um, I had a couple questions. One is when you, when you look at those start times, I used to do busing a lot. Um, as a rule of thumb, it was kind of like 15 minutes on either side of the time until things got cooking. And so the bus times or start and end times for buses are not, you can't, they're not, they can never be definitive like that because that's just not how it works. Is that a rule of thumb we can use as a board when we're thinking about arrival times for buses and start of the day? I would say that um, student transit will be, um, thinks they can get this. Okay. Now, I mean, granted, if it's a weather day, 
it's normal to have things be a little bit delayed. But the idea is that this is something that will be tight, but likely doable. The, over time, they might need to be adjusted, you know, five minutes here, earlier, later, you know, that sort of thing. But a lot of that, as the final planning happens, um, when we look at the, the actual establishment of the routes, um, they'll be looking at a lot of those things. And yes, there will be a certain amount of settling in. Yeah, I guess too, it's with little ones, which I was used to it, getting them in and off and out of houses and whatever, it takes time. The other question I had is, what was the input from the pre-KK people on the committee about starting their little ones earlier? Um, the multiple levels, if they had, if the whole, just like as a, as a child of, or I should say, different schools, um, it's, it's a matter of, if, uh, let me back up one more time. Putting the puzzle together, there's only so many ways the puzzle can be put together. And so we looked at um, where it could be, and we, work, we, worked, we worked with Heidi on, you know, earliest and latest end, and came up with ultimately where it fit the puzzle. So, Heidi, do you want to add anything to that? Really That's not the greatest answer. And one of the things to answer that, or to, to further that, if we if we wa are okay with adding dollars, student transit could look at, you know, do we add additional routes? And that's part of what these additional costs are going to be, because if we have to add additional routes, additional routes cost, and so that would have to be figured in. And so part of what we looked at from the from from our end is trying to bring that down as much as reasonable. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Duax? Do, we do you have any uh, percentages about how many students are bused in the high school level? Um, we discussed that. Um, I do not have that with me right now, though. Well, I just wondered because a lot of students bring cars to school and some students need busing, but. It seems One of the things like with that, though, we talked. Not that many. You know, that That's right. Well, I, I can kind of answer that if you want, because uh, I just did a tour. I want to thank Student Transit for giving us on a tour of their place. And we had a little discussion about how that works with them. Um, depending on the day, different number of students of high schools, because sometimes they drive, sometimes they don't, will take the bus. And so they have to, on each route, they have to have a certain capacity just in case. There are a lot on that route and they have to kind of estimate best based on past experience. So that does affect it and they've, they've kind of got models kind of predicting some of that and they have to go, go by those models. Uh, hopefully I got that accurately. Yeah. Um, yeah Catherine, um, I would just add, I was on that um, tour as well and kind of had the same thoughts that, you know, are we, do we have empty space on high school buses and actually if every child in the, in the, on the bus route rode, <coughs> They literally would have to like sit three to a seat, and you know how big the seats are, and how big high school kids are. So the they're um, they're running with the assumption of past patterns that an X number of kids are ne never going to ride the bus. So they've already accounted for that, and I was surprised at how um, I guess how many kids are identified in the in the bus in a bus route that don't ride. Well, I just thought it might be a consideration for riding the city bus and might help us with some of the other routes. One of the things we looked at though as far as that concept though was um, since our middle school and high school they, they piggyback, um, it's, it's not like you're running the middle school routes, dropping everybody off and then going to high school and then dropping everybody off. Going from one to the other, dramatically altering high schools, number of buses, that sort of thing does not save that much because really you're just driving from a high school to middle school or vice versa. 
because then they just go out after that. Uh, okay. <coughs> I just have one more question. Um, you mentioned something about peeling off snow days. Is that kind of what I said? Yes. Okay. If, if we do have a terrible winter and we've peeled those off, then we just go longer in June, and that's just a given. Right, okay. which, which again was part of the, I mean, in working with the, with the calendar committee and trying to find a compromise, I know there's some discussion when we were just looking at the calendar that the community, parents, ever, you know, would like to have that hard stop, and ideally we'd, like, we'd select to reach that. Um, but this, and trying to do that 280 or the 380, you know, is getting at that reduced number of snow days. Okay, I go, oh, Commissioner Zhang. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm wondering what is student transit doing that it's uh, costing that much in order to, to make these changes? Are they buying new buses? Because you said earlier that uh, alternating routes or using the bus to go from one place to the other is, is not going to be that, that much of a savings? Um, a couple things. There's a certain number of added routes we need to do. But there's also some inefficiencies as far as our elementary day is shorter than our middle school, high school day. And so you have, you have buses or drivers that have a larger gap of, of idle time, basically. And it's a, a long enough idle time that you can't just say, okay, you're off the clock for the next half hour, the next hour or next, well, next half hour, you know, so there's some of those. So we pay for the whole hour. So, the, well, there, there's some of those, there's some of the efficient inefficiencies by having a uh, middle school, high school day that's lo longer than an elementary day when you flip it. Um, and so it's a combination of those two things. Okay, so they are getting new buses? No? no not necessarily. Okay, so if we were to, instead of spending that money on idle time, <laughs> and we help with some program to where they can get new buses, will that save us money? This isn't about student transit um, getting the new, new buses, no. No, but I'm hoping that you're working very closely with them in order to, to try to get these costs down. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's an, an idea that you have uh, ventured. We do have a rep, of uh, student rep, on, on that committee. Uh, so, Marty, back there. <laughs> so what happened, uh, if I can explain just briefly, well, come on down. You don't mind? Come on down. The change of the calendar between, and my name is Marty Klukas, by the way, I'm the general manager at Student Transit. What happened last year, between last year's calendar and this year's calendar, is that it drove some inefficiencies. We went to school uh, we're going to school fewer days uh, for the 15, 16 school year. But that also, we had to create new routes to, to make up for those inefficiencies. When you change the length of the days, now we start the high school, middle schools first, so that long day first, and then we start the short day. When you flip that, now you have the short day starting first, and what that does is we want to create friction in the beginning of the day. Friction equals efficiency. But at the end of the day, there's a huge gap. And it also kicks into the Prairie Ridge. So if we were to slide that day back, you know, in other words, short, shorten the minutes of the high school, middle school, we actually create a window to use our same equipment to get the Prairie Ridge. So it's a pretty complicated uh, web with over 28 buildings. So. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Commissioner Luganville. I actually have a question for the student reps. I don't want to put them on the spot, but I wondered if you guys had any um, thoughts on the proposals and if you've had the chance to communicate about these changes with the student councils and see what their ideas were or comments were. I have talked to a, a, uh, a few students in the beginning of the year about starting school later in the day. and. <laughs> Uh, they were all for it. <laughs> um, but of course, they didn't know the other ramifications for starting school at 8.30, something like that. Um, but I've, I've gotten positive feedbacks for 8.30 or 8.35. They like the idea a lot. Thank 
you. Emily? Um, a lot of people that I talk to about it when it comes to students, they're all excited about 8.30, but a lot of um, people who have extracurricular activities of, are, of course, concerned about how late they'll be going till. Um, if we can, like, figure out how to, like, get down so that, like, the extracurricular activities can be less, like, late, I guess. Um, that's the only thing that my friends are concerned, like, you know, my friends that I've been talking to are concerned about. Other than that, everybody wants to sleep in. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, maybe we can go on to the next okay. part. That would be great. All right. Th <laughs> thanks, Park. So, and then some of this information we've seen before, so a little bit of it's a reiteration. But <clears throat> again, we have K-12 insight information data gathered from staff speaking to the importance of PD and IP time embedded throughout the school year. Again, you see that this is a reiteration of some of the information we've seen before. Staff members valuing those five days um, previous to the start of the school year for professional planning and um, all the business of starting up the school year. Here again, you can see the affirmation from staff their commitment to professional development during that time dedicated in October. And then again, you can see the instructional planning piece, even more adoration to the time given for staff members to do some of that critical work in the classroom. And then here you see the different levels. Again, feedback with that time that we had over the Thanksgiving break. Again, reaffirmation of the time given to work in the classroom and the time working being able to work in professional development committees. This is as positive, uh, positive staff feedback information or data you're, you're going to find in any level of, of the system. So some considerations here uh, that we've learned from other districts <clears throat> if you're going to embark upon um, a fundamental change of the start times. The importance of leadership of this, of this team to communicate with this system and then the entire community to build stakeholders throughout the system. We know that trans transportation, we just spent 20 minutes talking about how that is a major logistical and cost factor. The impact on athletics and co-curriculars, um, both that we provide and that our partnerships with recreational facilities throughout the, um, the community. We know that there's not a one size fits all. You can't borrow from one district and just superimpose upon ours. Um, that has successfully changed their start times. That putting a priority on sleep health is as important to school start time change as any of the other pieces that we're talking about. The adjustment simply takes time. It's a fundamental change in how we operate, how we provide our product. And that and the anticipation of all of this is significantly worse than the actual implementation. So, um, couple of options that we have to share with the board um, and then the board certainly has the purview to make any um, combinations or reiteration of this or delineation they'd like. One option to present would be a change of start time effective for the 2017-18 calendar and then some planning that would go with this all right, and, and creating an internal committee of key stakeholders at the different levels throughout the district then we would want to partner with our key community stakeholders. For example, um, the YMCA just is one example, our private um, um, parochial schools that we partnership with, creating task forces that communicate with all members of folks within the community that touch our schools, and then carrying out an action plan. And then we do have a, one additional proposal, or, to, or an option, I guess, that would just simply carry out the same plan that we talked about here, but change that implementation date to 2018. So rather than an 18 month rollout, this would give us approximately 30 months to, to um, go from pen to paper to, to actually changing the start date on the September 1 of that school year. So circling back to the original recommendation that the uh, board gave the committee um, about March last year, about 11 months ago, that we wanted to, and well, you can read this, read this here, but pursue a study of the school day start times using lessons learned from other districts that have successfully implemented a change in school start times. The committee believes that to be respectful to all individuals involved, the board needs to consider other obligations as well as key stakeholders and the complexity of the work proposed when determining an implementation date. And I believe that we're 
doing due diligence to the board's original charge. So next steps that we would like the board to, um, to speak to is committee, committing to a start time modification, then determining a calendar uh, and an option, a time frame to implement that work and then carry out that implementation timeline working with, with the committee if, if you so choose. Great, thank you. That's actually kind of... Do you want to go back? Sure. Yeah, you can keep that up. That was kind of the list, the list of my uh, things that I needed from the board. <laughs> um, Anticipatory set, Rich. Yeah. What's that? Anticipatory set. Natalie yeah, Hunter. exactly. Exactly. Uh, so, um, it doesn't that the board members don't necessarily have to comment in that order. Um, certainly, uh, the, the commit to start time modification would be which of the options uh, or others. Right? Or, what or, any, or other delineations. Which you're referring to. First, whether and if, which one yeah. we would do. Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, because um, I'll need, I'll need, I would like some guidance from the board on what uh, you, first it's for the start time committee, but also what do you want me to bring back to the board next time? Do you want it as a resolution or should we be a committee next time and so forth after hearing from the start time committee? So I could use a, a, some guidance. Commissioner Duax. Well, first of all, I need a copy of the different plans so I can study them and we may prefer to have a work session where we can discuss and just go over it and over it. Um, I guess I have a question about has PAC seen this? Uh, who's seen it? Who's seen the plan other than us? Uh, you mean these options? Yes. I, I think this first day Okay. outside the committee correct yeah correct Out, outside the committee it would be this would be the first um, first rollout yep the this. first rollout of it but keep in mind that the committee is represented of all of those st key stakeholders that the board identified sure. was critical to make these decisions in the first place or not decisions but recommendations I I do have a question um, about little children getting on the bus in the dark and getting off the bus in the dark and I assume that Prairie Ridge would have bus monitors. Is that true? People to help those children. I thought 420 was a change. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Commissioner Lugenville. I, I feel very scattered right now just having not seen any of this before tonight. Um, but I do think that I don't, I don't want us to mimic what Altoona did, but I want us to, um, they did a survey of the community before they made any sort of a commitment. And that's very important with this kind of an issue. Um, because we've, as far as I'm aware, we've done nothing in that area. And that's huge. Um, I mean, I have my ideas of what I think the community might say or not say, but I don't want to assume for them. I want them to speak for themselves. So I want to see that as one of our big priorities in the near future. Um, for that survey that you're thinking of, uh, would you basically want them to weigh in on the possibilities as well as well whether or not to do it in the first place? Is that kind of what you're thinking? Okay. All right. Uh, Commissioner Vu. First of all, I want to thank the committee's time. I believe you invest a lot of time and did a good job giving the information that we have seen. I'm glad that the calendar piece seemed to be concrete and urgent. We need to get going. But the second part, the start time, I believe that it's very important, but it's not urgent. And we have more urgent item, like the referendum coming up. It would be hard to justify spending more money, but if you don't spend more money, you don't get, qual you don't get quality work either. So I'm proposing that we table the start time until appropriate time to bring it back, recognizing the hard work that the staff already put into we don't want to push it back to the committee to look any further because they have done what they could and the best that they can. Okay. 
good. Uh, others? Other comments? Uh, Commissioner Johnson? Oh, I have a lot of comments. Where to start? Um, <laughs> well, I, I, we came to the, in option D, kind of reinforce something that I, th I think uh, Kay may have mentioned at the very beginning, that by shortening the day of the high school and middle school, we bring down the cost. And um, during our tour of um, student transit, we had an opportunity to ask a lot of questions about how they make all of that work. And um, that leads me back to kind of the very beginning, the makeup of the committees. While the start time ha is well represented with stakeholders, you know, early childhood providers and parents and students, et cetera, et cetera, the calendar committee is not. It was only staff, um, no parents, no community members. And, um, you know, I, I'm not going to be popular when I say this, but the calendar used to be a negotiated item by the union. And it has not been negotiated by the, by the union for five years now. Um, but we're still treating it as if it is. And so up until this start time committee, this new portion, the other half, there was only internal people working on our calendar. And they had no trouble bringing us this calendar last year and again this year. That is really good for them and it's good for instruction and that's wonderful. Um, but, you know, when we talk about, you know, we can't, we can't shorten the day and, you know, have all this professional development, um, you know, we added without adding contract days and paying them. Well, I know that teachers, like many other professions, work outside of their contracted hours. And, you know, we've done a lot to alleviate some of that, um, you know, but that work that's being done in the nine hours that they have, or the nine days that they have, you know, the five days before the start of school, Let's be honest, the teachers were working five days before the start of the school, even if they only got paid for two of them or three of them. And so, you know, what we've done is we've, I guess, reduced their workload, but we've not addressed the needs of kids. And so when I hear it's not urgent, my, I can literally feel my blood pressure raise because my daughter was a, was a freshman and she is now 22 years old. And we are still talking about this. Every single one of those kids who can't focus in first and second hour on their math or their chemistry or whatever it is they have, they are never going to have chemistry again. They're never going to have AP stats again. They're never going to have their sophomore year, their junior year. Six years later, we are not doing what's right for kids. And we're letting the teachers dictate that. And so last year, they gave us a calendar that added 15 minutes to the day with zero implementation time. We sat here at this very time of year and said, next year, families, you're going to figure it out. Your transportation times may change, your child care may change by 15 minutes. And that might make the difference between having to hire a babysitter or not. And we said, we're going to do this because it's good for teachers. And so now we're sitting here talking about Last year at this time, well, we're not going to do it for 16, 15, 16. And we're not going to do it now for six, seven, 16, 17. Now we're talking about 17 or 18. We have literally missed an entire generation of kids. If we can do it for teachers, we can do it for kids. I suggest we take a version of Plan D. And I might add, on that tour, we learned that at the time that this was being discussed a year and a half ago, people said, well, why aren't we doing this at the same time? It would really make sense to just do this at the same time and then instead of doing one thing and going back and doing the other. And those guys back there are fantastic. And if we want a $0 increase, they can tell us how to do it. But it might mean taking 17 minutes off the day. We don't need four snow days. We need two snow days. And once in a while, we're going to have an extra day here or there. So be it. Make one in February, make one in April, make one in June, but do what's right for kids because now six years later, we're still talking about two, three years down the road. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Zhang. If they can do what you said, I will vote for it, 
but realistically right now if we're going into a referendum we I feel we're going to be overworking everyone by trying to get this calendar and this start time in there as well but I I, I do agree with you we have to do what's right for kids Mr. Hambuck Boyle um, I hear your frustration um, Wendy Sue and um, I would as I would like to I would like to initiate the start time as soon as we could but I can't sit here and not equate what is good for teachers in what they set up and what they do to collaborate for kids that that's not good for kids I think both are good for kids and um, we have to figure out how we're going to make that work others okay a um, couple points here um, first uh, maybe a discussion about the survey to see I, I do think right now the start time committee has done a lot of work and I'm not sure we have direction for you to do more I'd rather you not do more until we give you <laughs> give you a significant you know real guidance on it um, in terms of the survey um, I don't know is I mean uh, uh, superintendent um, Hardebeck, um, is that something K-12 could do rather easily? It might be interesting to get the community feeling on this. I, I don't mind that idea. Uh, um, just to clarify, Mr. I'm Johnson, pretty sure Altoona did only parents. They didn't do a community survey. They did a parent survey. Did parents? Okay, which would seem the most appropriate, actually. Um, so I, I, I like that idea if other board members are interested in that. Uh, Commissioner Duax, go ahead. Well, I'd like to get a handle on it first myself before we do anything else. And... Uh, I'm not willing to wait on this either. I think we need to go ahead with it and get it, get it done. And I want to thank the committee for all the work they've done. Okay, and I, I'm with you there too. I feel like you know the Start Time Committee's done all this work. I don't want to set it on the shelf now. Um, I think we, need, we owe it to them to make a decision whether or not to go forward and decide what option. Um, I don't mind uh, waiting a little bit to see if we can get some data from parents on this uh, through a survey. I don't mind doing that, waiting a little bit, and that gives you time to think about it also. Um, my next question is um, in terms of calendar next year. I mean, we do have to approve a calendar for next year also. Um, so uh, comments on that or other things? Uh, I Commissioner think we X. can bring that to resolution at the next board meeting. Okay, so there's a suggestion for that. For Commissioner Duax, yes. Uh, Commissioner Hammock Boyle. Can we approve the calendar with flexibility? Uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, but we need a set calendar <laughs> for the fall. <laughs> okay, I mean, I mean, we couldn't specify kind of why the flexibility is there? I'm not sure what Specific you mean. to our conversation tonight is what I'm saying. You know, with the snow days or whatever. I guess I'm not sure what you mean, but okay. <laughs> Mr. Johnson. If we accept the calendar, then we're putting it off another year. And so my request would be to bring us a calendar with two snow days instead of four so that we can be talking in the parameters of options B, C, and D where we're going to shave time off four minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, you know, are we going to spend money? We, are we going to not? But all three of those were two with a possible third makeup day in April. Pre President Sinberg? Yes, go Just, ahead. Can I clarify on that? Yeah. Uh -huh. the, ex the calendar that we presented to you, if we modify the student day, that can impact the, that would impact and be our first recommendation for trying to capture back some minutes to give this flexibility to student transit, is to use the existing calendar and shorten the student day at the secondary level. So same number of days, same number of contract days, same number of student contact days as proposed today in this evening's calendar. We would simply shorten the secondary day by X number of minutes. Four minutes to five minutes is uh, within the capacity of the additional snow day minutes that exist that currently allow us four days of inclement weather versus two. So if we simply shorten the student day at the secondary level, we could reduce the commitment to snow days from four to two. 
So, so uh, just to clarify what that would do. clarify what that the calendar is ready to go. Yeah, with a step toward that. Um, th does it seem reasonable to the board and you guys could weigh in also to uh, do that for the calendar next year? Does, I mean, does that help plan for a change in start time? Say the following year, does it help to do that um, in terms of planning? Um, and you guys could answer that, and you may not be ready. Uh, Without, you know, we're talking about, well, maybe we should remove some snow days to help us plan for start times the following year, but does, does that really help is, is my question. Again, I'm sorry, again, the calendar as is could, re by adjusting the student day, so you could accept the calendar as is and then at a later time direct um, the administration to adjust the student day to gain back That's the flexibility, flexibility I was wondering. Oh, I see, because the calendar is set. Regardless of when the time, how long the day is, is what you're saying. Correct, right? Calendar, calendar yeah. commitment of days is different than calendar commitment of minutes. Yes, through gotcha. student day. Understood. That was what Understood. I wanted to. Understood. Thank you. Thank specify you. the flexibility. That's what I commend. Yeah, I, I want to come back to what I said earlier. If the board is open to having the discussion that whatever expense come out of start time be taken into consideration for what's going to be increased in the referendum budget total. So throw back this question to the budget committee to look at it as a package. I will be open to that discussion. Okay, so to uh, especially the uh, increase in cost to tra to switch to start times go to budget to discuss the budget um, ramifications of that the financial ramifications. okay that's your suggestion okay uh, I'm gonna summarize what I've heard so far um, uh, I have heard so far that um, it seems there is a uh, something of commitment uh, from most board members to try start times at least uh, to not um, delay it too much um, but to uh, find out more feedback from the community on this in particular from parents is that a reasonable summary so far yes. okay um, that next year we would not change the days uh, is, a, is a fair summary from most board members I would not say all but most board members that you would not be ready to change start times next fall so if you want to weigh on that I would love to hear that I, I think I know Commissioner Johnson <laughs> feeling on that uh, how about other board members because uh, I, I, I do the most immediate thing I do need to do in agenda setting is decide when to bring the calendar to the, to the board for next fall so it, I'm sorry if it's going to come to back to budget committee to look at um, how we can compensate by for it that means start times mm -hmm. for the start time I'm going to presume it's gonna go up by quite a lot right uh, now what I see is we're already having issues trying to put put down what we want to happen if we keep adding on and I understand the the importance of this for kids and I would love to have this as well but is it is it realistic well ultimately the, the board can um, reject uh, or a board member even if it was on say for a referendum proposal could reject to have that piece of it and majority board they could remove it or we could just not include it. Um, but we could discuss that in the budget committee, certainly. Commissioner Duex. What is the ramification for the transportation company and making a complete switch? How difficult is that? Um, yeah, um, during the process, Student Transit said that a 16-17 um, type change would be virtually impossible. 
or quite difficult at least. Yeah, also, nothing's impossible. We, we, could, we could do it. However, to tell you the amount of effort that we put in just to change last year's calendar, the 1415, to this 1516, we worked through the summer and we moved into a new facility. So it, anything, another drop here and there, we would not have been able to handle it, quite frankly. So it's a, it's a tremendous amount of planning effort to get everything in sync. And of course, we'd want to not explode the routes. In other words, we want to keep the continuity of the routes to the best of our ability. And to do that, just it takes a tremendous amount of time. I mean, we literally spoke with drivers uh, four and five occasions, each one of them. And we have about 115 drivers. So it's a, it's a significant amount of work. So realistically, it would probably be better if we started in 17, 18. If we from, do from our perspective, it would be much easier to plan. You know, we could use the summers, both summers, to uh, to really flesh the flesh the plan out. Okay. If we did it, uh, I mean, we, again, we could do anything, but it's just going to be very, very difficult to do sure. for this next year. Thank you. Um, may, may I? Um, Go ahead. The, 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 other, the other thing that Student Transit mentioned um, was if you look at the other. Uh, other community stakeholders, which is the second bullet down, um, realize that if we do a start time change, if and when we do a start time change, the start times of all of those um, partners, or uh, all those private and parochial schools within Eau Claire, their start times would also likely need to change. And so um, that's something that we need to make sure as community partners um, that we give them some time too. Okay, I have a, so I have a, this is my suggestion, which I will bring to agenda setting um, on this. Um, I suggest um, we, we look at surveying parents on start times. When we get that data back, we bring that data back to the board with these options again, and we can have a, another, a more discussion about what the board favors on that and, and give direction um, to administration on that. And in the meantime, we could bring uh, the budget numbers to the budget committee to discuss how that might impact our budget and how we might be able to incorporate that into our budget. So two parallel um, motions, uh, movements on that. And I think also uh, next time I would suggest that we bring this calendar, the current calendar, back to the board, uh, this one, uh, so we can have further discussion and we could discuss about the snow days piece at that time. Um, we could either bring it as a committee report if we think there's going to be a lot of discussion or as a resolution um, at that. How does that sound, Mr. Luganbill? How quick can we get the turnaround on a parent survey so we can keep this moving? We'll have to talk to our, we'll have to contact uh, K-12. Our, our current, our current uh, parent survey, family climate survey, is scheduled from March 29th through April 12th. Um, it takes quite a while to get that thing cranked up. Um, something to keep, I mean, just there's a lot of pieces that have to be put in place. And we did a big push last year, uh, and we increased from about 18% to 22% response rate. So that's something to think about um, if we do the K-12 Insight route. Um, you, even if we have an improvement, um, typically you, you will not get over, you'll be somewhere, if we have a really good year, it'll be, be between 25 and 30%. So think about whether or not that's a return rate that would help you make decisions. Otherwise, we may have to look at a different methodology like parent-teacher conference surveys or something else. Okay. And I would point out that we did have comments about start times on a previous we parent did. survey yep. that yep. indicated s support for it in that. I mean, it wasn't a, actually a question on the survey, but we had, I think it was open-ended comments mm -hmm. in it, if I understand mm -hmm. it right. Um, so, but it just wasn't a question about details about it. Um, I, I would leave it up to administration to figure out the soonest and the best way to get that. I don't think we need to figure out that implementation. Uh, Commissioner Zhang. And just for clarification, K through K-12 will be free? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's under our contract. That, I mean, it's under our contract. they have an overall contract with us for it, so. Um, Commissioner Duax. Yes, I wanted to ask our student reps if you can do a little more digging and find out if students have jobs after work and how that will affect them and of course, you already mentioned the extracurricular activities, so but just keep asking. I'd like to have a little more feedback. Excellent point. I think the student council is, you know, 
main avenue for you. And um, you could go into a little more detail with these different options with them. Uh, Jason. Um, would you like us to do a survey? Um, one of the homeroom days, we can ask the students. How does that, I think it's a good idea. How does the board feel? Yeah, I would just suggest working with administration to do a, a kind of a, a real valid uh, survey because uh, it's sometimes it's difficult to phrase the questions in a way right. that doesn't bias and so forth. So, yes, Emily. Do you think you could send us the PowerPoint with all of the information added? Sure, it'll be a public document. Yeah, okay. it'll be in board docs, absolutely. Uh, Commissioner Hambach Boyle. I just, um, as we close this, I just really don't want to automatically think that we have to wait. I think as a board, we need to keep this up front and center and see if we can't possibly keep the conversation going for the change as soon as possible, if in fact that's what our constituents and the surveys tell us. Okay? I would, I would agree. I mean, everyone knows that this is something I wanted, and I want to make sure the board is comfortable with it. Um, so uh, we do need to weigh in more seriously on the options, but if you really want to wait for data from parents, we can do that for a little while. But I do think, you know, in a month or two, two months, we do want to commit somehow or another. When I made my remark before, like I need to study it a little bit, I don't mean I need two months. Yeah, right. uh, and I don't feel that we should, as a board, wait until we have that data back from parents. But okay. I think we should kind of hone in on it and see what we think would work best if we're going to do this. So given that, do you want to me to schedule this again in like, you know, in two meetings for the board to discuss even if we don't have survey data? Is that is that what you're implying? Yes. yes. Are others interested in that? I mean, basically, I mean, we have we have the options before us. We have the possibilities. Um, we certainly could do that as a committee report if you wish. Or, well, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. Um, Maybe a work session, but I, I think a committee as a committee is fine also. Commissioner John. Can we incorporate this with the uh, RFP that we agreed on earlier? I don't know. <laughs> Something we could think about. We'll, we'll, if, if the others could, could look at it and think about it, that would, in the administration, that would be interesting to see. Okay. Any further comments? Threading a needle here a little bit. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, public comment. Is there any public comment on this? Thank you. I forgot. Uh, thank you, Joe, for mentioning that. So, uh, well, one, and then you can go up, Carolyn, next. Go ahead. Beth Christensen. I'm the facility use coordinator for the Eau Claire School District. I work with all of the community groups that rent and use our facilities when we're not. So just a reminder to you that um, typically by now I've let them know what days um, our schools are closed to them and what times if we're going to do, a ch and I know our, our schools are for our students and education first, but um, people will start reserving space and sending me checks and if we're going to have our middle schools um, start school later and end school later then community use will begin later and so I just need to let community know that before they've reserved space paid for that space have a contract for that space so the sooner we know whether we're flipping times for this next school year the better because that's our kids that's our community same people absolutely understood thank you uh, Carolyn did you have so just, I forgot to state your name and so forth. She did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't mention it before. Yeah. Carolyn Gabrielson Barstead, 2002 Redwood Drive, Eau Claire. Um, I, I started teaching when I was 21 years old. I'm 74 now. And um, over those years, I've seen a lot of different fads come and go in education. Um, this, this one, of having the older kids start later uh, seems to me started out east somewhere where I started reading about different schools that were doing this and um, felt that they had some backup saying that this was best for the older kids, etc. I'm not sure that that's true after teaching at Memorial High School and North High School and 
DeLong Middle School and Central Junior High School. Um, it seems to me that kids react to how they get up in the morning, what class they have that starts their day, uh, the people that go to school with them, etc. I know there has been some research done on this, but I'm not sure that I believe the research, actually, after being in the classroom for 35 plus years. Um, I, I would think that there would be all kinds of different things that parents might bring up. One of the things that I've asked has been, well, if the older kids get home later, who's taking care of the younger kids that come home first? Um, the other question that I have, and it's a big one, is that many, many, many high school kids participate in different activities after school. Many, many, many kids have jobs. A lot of them have to have jobs. And I think this fad is going to play itself out eventually. I'm not for this at all. Zero. Thank you, Carolyn. OK, we have more on our agenda. So I think we're ready to move on, assuming public comment is done. OK, let's do that. So next on our agenda is an update on the WASB resolutions. Um, we already got an update. <laughs> so I don't know if there's any comment on that, but it, there's nothing we could do. They've, they've voted on it already at WASB. So is there anything about WASB resolutions from anybody? OK. All right. So uh, now we have a discussion and uh, first reading, possible first reading of policy 221. Uh, just a little background on this. You know, the Policy and Governance Committee has been um, trying to update a lot of policies uh, uh, to correct things from the past or to ma make sure we align with statutes. And this is one that I had brought up with them that I noticed uh, the date was um, a problem in it um, as well as uh, a couple other things. And so they've been working on, on, on this a couple times. And so they've got uh, one for us. I don't know if we can put it up there. For their, my, my suggestion was to them was, you know, just uh, let's look at the statutes. What does the statute say about renewals? How does that work? What are the deadlines? And see if we can get this in policy. Um, so he, you can see the crossed out, how short it was before. You can see this December 1st date, which really didn't match what statute allowed. Um, and uh, it's, it's very short. It doesn't really describe the possibilities uh, with contract renewals. Um, so uh, I don't know if the... P&G has any comments before I open it up or I make any comments? Do you have anything to say any, about the process? Yes, uh, Commissioner Duex. Well, just that we met with uh, Steve Weld, our attorney, this morning, and we made a few more changes to it. So if you would like it read, we can do that. OK, thank you. Um, I, I have, uh, then, I have a, a couple comments about it. Um, thank you for changing the date, because the, the uh, the statute says five months since contract uh, ends or starts, and that's July 1. So you go back five months, you got January 31st, which is good in there. Um, my one concern is the, the first paragraph with the last paragraph. Um, superintendent shall be initially appointed at a regular meeting of a four, two year period. And I had expressed concerns that, well, you know, what if you have an interim, for example, that you only hire for a year or something of that nature. And so I see you put that at the bottom that if you did have an interim, that might address that. My, my, my feeling um, is that just may be an unnecessary complication because then you have to define what does it mean to be an interim. And then suppose you then want to hire an interim permanently after that first time you hire them. So is that their first year or is that renewing? Um, so it seems a little bit of an unnecessary complication. So for me, I, I, don't, I don't, just don't understand why you don't just remove that last sentence and just say initially appointed up to a two-year period. That gives that board at that time to decide if it's an interim, they'll give them a one-year or whatever. <laughs> if it's a new superintendent, they give them a two-year contract. I, I, to me, that just seems an unnecessary complication why you wouldn't just put up to and just remove that last sentence. So that was one thing that I noticed. Uh, Mr. Hambuck-Boyle. 
The conversation is that okay. Yeah. The conversation yeah. we had about that was um, the pool for you know superintendency positions um, and people look at policy. I mean, policy drives pretty much everything these days. So they'd be very cognizant to look. And we were thinking to put a one uh, up to a two year and not specify the interim superintendency piece of it that we wouldn't necessarily, you know, we might not be looked at as a place that people would put their head in for superintendency. I mean, that was kind of the discussion. Do you want to? Yeah, this, what you brought up was probably one of the main sticky areas that we did spend a considerable amount of time on. And we were, there were kind of two camps. Do we put, you know, for, in the first sentence, do you put for a one or two year period or put, you know, for up to a two year period? Um, or do you specifically define um, an interim role? Um, and there were there was disagreement and ju just different interpretations of it. But so that's that's why you know it's in this state now. But opening it up now um, to the rest of the board, we can see where everyone else is at. Yeah, for for me, I, I, I'm not sure I buy that argument. And someone wants, I mean, I can't. It's hard to imagine just looking at this policy if you had up to or no more than two year period that would dissuade someone from looking at a district and you're going to tell them when they come, well, we're going to offer you a two-year contract. <laughs> uh, I don't know how that uh, are you Are you talking about the interim? Uh, well, either way, I mean, the first sentence, the first sentence I'm just saying. Um, I'm just saying if you, if you, it would just be simpler to just say no more than a two-year period because that, that allows, if it is an interim, to give them one year or whatever. Um, right? I, I, I don't see the, the necessity of that last sentence. So that's, that's my comment. Well, we had an interim before Dr. Hardebeck came, and he was here, I think, four months or so. Uh, and he just told us, well, when you find somebody to hire, then I'll be done. So we didn't specify. He specified. So that's why we just just said it would be a shorter term contract and that would have to be worked out with the board. Okay. I'm just going to play devil's advocates. Okay. So, <laughs> do that. So, so suppose you hire an interim yeah. for a year and then you decided to, oh, uh, we're going to hire that interim permanently. Is that the initial appointment where you have to give them another two year or is that where you could offer them another year? When I read this policy, I'm not sure. So you see the conflict. See, I, I just don't want that kind yeah, of thing to happen in the saying, future to a future board. That, I think that you know just has saying. to be negotiated. Help well, me out here, Wendy. It's just a question, really, what the policy says yeah. you, allows you to do. So if you're going to go this route, I would just be more comfortable, at least, that you have you know Kirk, our board attorney, look at yeah. it because he, he specializes in this stuff. So that would be my preference if you want to go that route. Uh, Commissioner Johnson. Um, I would support inserting no longer than after the word for in the first sentence and dropping the last sentence as well. I think that makes sense and it gives future boards flexibility. Yep. I personally have no problem with that and for the sake of legal bills, I'd, I'd be willing to make a friendly <laughs> amendment to this tonight. Way to go, Joe. We've had a lot of memos lately. I'm okay with that too. So. I'll vote for it. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any other comments on this. Um, on this. Um, Are we policy? saying we're putting that in and taking the last off? That is a suggestion. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. That is a suggestion to say school board for no more than a two-year period and remove that last sentence. That is the suggestion. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions? Do you have anything you're interested otherwise on this? Um, did you have time to read it? Because it was posted um, <laughs> this early this afternoon. Make sure you had time to review it. I mean, this is, a, this is an important policy for us, right? One of the main school board um, roles. So.
Yeah, we'll do that if they're ready to go. Yeah, yeah if, and if then they're they ready. take out the last one, and then you can have the first reading. Well, you, right. Well, that's just, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting to see if the board has any other concerns or comments. I just want to make sure you've had really time to think about this policy to make sure we don't cause a problem for a board six years, ten years yeah. from now, because these stay on the books for a long time, right? So just want to make sure that. All right. Um, the only other thing I, well, I guess that's not necessarily, we don't need to do that. Okay. Um, so, is anyone ready to uh, do a reading where we would substitute for a no more than two year period and without the last sentence? Sure, I can read it. You want to try it? Okay. Commissioner Luganville, go ahead. No, I'm good. The superintendent of schools shall be initially appointed at a regular meeting of the school board for no longer than a two-year period by a majority vote of the board. Benefits and salary shall be set at the time of appointment. The superintendent's employment contract may be extended at a regular meeting of the board on or before January 31, its statutory non-renewal deadline, for a one- or two-year period by a majority vote of the full board with the salary and benefits to be set annually prior to July 1. While the school board and the superintendent can mutually agree to a one-year extension, the superintendent is not to have contract terms that exceed two years. In the event the superintendent's contract is not extended, preliminary notice of the intent to non-renew must be issued at least five months prior to the end of the contract's term, January 31. If the administrator requests it, a hearing must be held and the final decision must be issued on or before four months prior to the end of the contract's term. A majority vote of the full board is required to non-renew. In the event the board fails to timely renew or non-renew the superintendent's contract, the contract then in force shall continue for two years. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Ambuk. And there was a switch at the top where it says recruitment appointment of superintendent. It should read recruitment employment of superintendent. Yeah. Yeah. That didn't get changed on there either. All right, so the title will say Recruitment Employment, mm -hmm. you said? Oh, Superintendent. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you for thank you for the, thank you for the work on that. Yes, is there, a, is there a typo on the third paragraph from the bottom of preliminary notice? The capitals. The capitals scratched the capital. out. That was an original part of the policy, so you technically can't delete it. You have to just cross out any any letter that you're removing. That was part of the original. So just because you um, lowercase it, you have to X, cross, put a line through the capital one to show that that was the old it's wording. Crossed out. The big P is crossed out. Yeah, big P has gone. Little little P's put in place. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> good question, though. Good question. I like some detail. Noticing detail. That's good. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for the so work. So I'll that. bring that to resolution. Correct. Since we did morning. the first reading, we'll bring it back. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Policy 225. Another one here. Let's see uh, what that one is. So uh, this was another one. I think you brought it once before to us, and we had some discussion about this one. Um, so let's look through that. Uh, some of the changes on it. Um, in the beginning, progress shall be okay. Uh, that's part of. So I'd say some significant changes was changing shalls to mays in the middle and then the summary uh, piece at the end. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know any discussion from P&G or from board members on this policy. Uh, Commissioner Johnson. In the first paragraph, shouldn't the apostrophe S be s stricken? Is that the right word? Before the as part of? The annual goals and objectives set forth by the Board of Education as part of its ongoing strategic planning process. And then in number three, I would suggest that the board, the, um, sorry, the third sentence in the last sentence in paragraph three, the board, comma, with input from the superintendent, comma, shall decide which groups will be surveyed and define the questions of the survey. Yes. 
So on that number three also, um, is the board comfortable with may instead of shall? One is the directive, the other is the option. Commissioner Johnson. I don't think it's a problem to give future boards the discretion of have doing conducting the survey in the way that they find best without having to rewrite the policy every year, which is what they would do anyway. That sounds fair. Is that what you're thinking That's the was? exact conversation we had. Okay. Thanks, Wendy. Okay. All right. Hence the number four, why it was changed to May from shall also. Okay. 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 So let's go down a little further. So um, I would like to clarify the five and six. It says the board shall complete the evaluation in closed session. And then six, it says a summary of the evaluation. So uh, my question there is, shall complete the evaluation. Are you talking a written evaluation shall complete first? So you mean a written evaluation? Okay. I so would, we should add that then, the written evaluation. Okay, five written. Now there was some disagreement over the interpretation with the last, I wanted to keep the last sentence in five. Our attorney didn't think it was necessary with the wording of six and because of what state law prescribes. So just so you know some background on that. Yeah, so now if we have, Commissioner Johnson, go ahead. Just to weigh in on your comment in five, I would say that the board shall complete the evaluation in closed session um, and then add the written part after that because the evaluation process is bigger than just presenting the written the written summary and so I think that you know the board shall complete the evaluation in closed session and then with a written summary to be presented to the superintendent so you know it's clear that you're doing this process together in closed session and then you're creating a written summary that's given to the superintendent and then that summary is referred to in six. Then in six, I would say the summary. Sure. Because it's yeah. not uh, is the one referred to in five. Yep, agreed. Would it be helpful to the board to have the PNG just reword that and bring it back yeah. rather than us doing that here? I'd rather not do too much wordsmithing here. Well, uh, it's yeah, I mean, it. Yeah, so I mean, then we could do a quick read next time. I would, I'd be feel more comfortable with that myself with this. Mr. Johnson. Since it's, it's only t two phrases, I guess I'd be comfortable reading it because we have to read it again before we vote on it next time. So, do you have them? Do you have them down? Go ahead. I really, I'm, I'm also interested in the Kirk Strang looking at it to make sure it's good. It's, it's part of my interest also. But yeah, Commissioner Vu. On item four, two questions. The last sentence, this shall be presented as a formal report to the Board of, Ed of Education. Is that closed session? Good point. So it's closed sessions. Then I recommend that we include, you know how we said for the, um, superintendent to address the performance standards in the job description and the goal annual goals to include the previous evaluation progress. So you have three components for the superintendent to be able to respond to, to report. Currently we have a response to the annual goal uh, respond to the job description, but then I think it's beneficial for the superintendent to be able to respond to the previous evaluation recommendation from the board for improvement, continuation improvement. For the things that have been suggested from the last evaluation? Correct. That's why I asked if this meeting is in closed sessions. Yeah. Yes, all, because it is about all uh, personnel, yeah. right? Yeah, it would be under 1985 1C, right. anyhow. 
So yes. And, and my point for adding this so that the summary, the, the, uh, the report from the superintendent is relevant. Okay, to, so including that reference to the last eval. So I think really we need to just add those separately. I think it would be cleaner, cleaner. I don't mind doing that. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Good, good discussion. Any Anything else on that? Okay, thank you. All right, uh, new policy 665, fraud prevention and recycling. So tell me, is this one that um, basically come up because we is required mm -hmm. <laughs> statute yes, or yes. rules or something? Yeah. This was a, in our WASB policy review, this was a missing policy uh, from our policy book. So um, it was suggested that we either develop one or adapt one from the WASB. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so we got a new policy here, which is what we need. All right, comments from board members. Any questions or comments about this one? Fraud prevention reporting. Do you just want to give, I don't know, Chris, kind of the overall what it's about, what it's for, so anyone can do that for us quick or so the public knows? We, we, we had to do this so we you can see that the different components that are involved in it but we had a great conversation about how we cross references cross reference this with other policies such as our annual audit um, staff gifts gifts uh, staff acceptable use of technology because once we got into this it kind of crosses over into a lot of areas so that's why we thought we'd bring it up to the board and have you take a look at it first Commissioner Luganville. I, I can walk you through what each paragraph just covers in like a word each if it's helpful, but um, it's it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and I should add that it's it's timely that we're doing this now as a local government entity with what's been on in the news lately. I think it's it's good that we reassure the public that we're working on these things. So. Okay. That's fine. Uh, so the part that says in, insert alternative administrator, are we Playing, putting something else in there. Is that how it's meant to be in policy, where it says insert? It would be to the executive director of business. Okay. That's that's the term that should be inserted there. Okay. Not business manager, but executive director of. Okay. So I guess that leads to my question: Are you planning on a first? reading now where we would insert those correct words in there when we do the reading or is, is, no, that, so is that the idea? Just two Johnson. small word suggestions. In paragraph two, um, second sentence, I would say each member instead of every member. And then in the last paragraph, oh, second sentence the third line whenever necessary or appropriate investigations shall instead of will last paragraph third line whenever necessary or appropriate investigations shall um, so under uh insert alternative administrator we'd have executive director of business and the other insert positions would be basically what it says there mm -hmm. district, district administrator business manager executive director yes. business manager or board president yes okay 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 all right is the board ready for a first reading on that uh, okay how about i have someone do the first two paragraphs and we'll someone do the third paragraph okay so i'm gonna do the first two paragraphs okay commissioner handbook boy Oh, fraud prevention and reporting 665 the school board expects all employees board members consultants vendors con contractors and other parties maintaining any business or programmatic relationship with the district to act with integrity due diligence and in accordance with all applicable laws district policies and procedures and matters involving district fiscal resources the district is entrusted with public dollars and no person connected with the district should do anything to erode that trust. 
The district administrator or designee shall be responsible for developing internal controls designed to prevent and detect fraud, financial impropriety, or fiscal irregularities within the district. Every member of the district's administrative team shall be alert for any indication of fraud, financial impropriety, or irregularity within his or hers areas of responsibility. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to read the next part if you want. Go ahead. Okay. Except in situations where an employee has exercised a legal right to make a confidential report to an external agency or to participate in an official investigation or legal proceeding that is not disclosed to his or her employer, any employee who has knowledge of or who has reason to suspect fraud or any similar impropriety in relation to any di aspect of district programs or operations shall immediately report the relevant circumstances to his or her supervisor and or to the district administrator. In the event the concern or complaint involves the district administrator, the concern shall be brought to the attention of the executive director of business and or board president. Such reports may involve or relate to the conduct of any person, including district employees, board members, volunteers, consultants, vendors, contractors, and other parties maintaining any business or programmatic relationship with the district. So I want to take the next paragraph or two. Starting at the board. Yes. The board also encourages any other person who has knowledge of or who has reason to suspect fraud or some other similar impropriety in relation to any aspect of district programs or operations to report the relevant circumstances to the executive director of business or the board president. Is that what we want? Uh, district administrator also. Oh, okay. No official employee or agent of the district may retaliate or discriminate against any person who acting reasonably and in good faith has filed a report under this policy or participated in any investigation related to a report of fraud, suspected fraud, or other similar impropriety. Shall I finish? Sure. Following a report of alleged or suspected fraud and except in the case of a report involving his or her own actions, the district administrator, is that what we want? shall be responsible for initiating an appropriate investigation. Whenever necessary, our appropriate investigations will be so conducted. So that's the one that uh, Wendy suggested, in shall instead of will. Investigations shall be conducted in coordination with district legal counsel and or with other internal or external departments, agencies, or officials. Although strict and absolute confidentiality cannot be guaranteed, the confidentiality concerns of all involved parties shall be a consideration in the manner in which any investigation is conducted, including the manner in which relevant records are maintained. Great, thank you. So we'll and bring. And then we've cross-referenced. I'm not sure we have all of them, but do you want me to read those? I don't think so. We don't. We don't normally read okay. those. So that's okay. Uh, Commissioner Hambuck, you want to turn off your mic? Please? <laughs> thank you. Uh, so okay. So we'll bring this back next time under the uh, consent agenda. All right, so last two items are basically with the compensation committee. Um, the compensation committee and the leaders of the committee wanted some feedback from the board on handle, especially how to handle a few items, um, to get some feedback on those, and um, then we'll be done for tonight. So soon? What's that? So soon. So soon. Want to take a break before we start? No. no? Okay. No, we'll keep going. Okay, just checking. People getting up to leave. I thought, yeah. all right, let's time go uh, home. They're, they're just going to look for some Snickers that are in the other room. <laughs> Little energy to keep. Exactly. It on. Right. Okay. okay so um, <laughs> the the presentation before you at this point is uh, both Abby and I talking about different compensation committee items. And so this came about from a couple board meetings ago when the board had determined when the board had determined that we were going to push the referendum into the fall 
and kind of the shockwave that went through everybody working on the compensation committee, um, going, oh my gosh, now what's going to happen? Um, I just want to make sure everybody's aware, and I believe that you are board members, that everybody who's working on the compensation committees, those three subcommittees and then the, whole, the committee of the whole, everybody on those committees, and I believe the people that they work closely with in their buildings, they're all very cognizant of the district's financial situation, and they understand that we need to do due diligence to be able to get to where we need to be to make things change positively here in the district. On the flip side of that, they're also looking for something to happen. And so a lot of conversation has happened as of late in terms of what, if anything, can we bring forward to the board in terms of compensation and or working conditions that could be kind of that bridge between now and when we're actually, actually able to do something with the compensation committee work. And so um, that's been the conversation that we've had with those different committees within the past couple of weeks. Um, and I can tell you that they're very realistic with what it is that they're thinking about and talking about in those committees as they look to try to make things better um, in their buildings here in Eau Claire. So there's actually, there's multiple things we're gonna talk about. There's only one recommendation that we have for the board to actually consider for the next, for approval at the next um, board meeting. Everything else that we're going to bring up are things that we've talked about, but that need further investigation it isn't something that we'd be able to turn around um, as quickly as what we're able to do with this one. So the first thing we wanna talk about is the flexibility and leave allowance. So you can see that currently, a school year um, employee gets 10 sick days and one personal day for a total of 11 paid leave days throughout the year. And as a 12 month person, there's 12 sick days and one personal day, excluding 12 month administrators. 12 month administrators do not receive a personal day. And so for the most part, 12 month employees receive 13 leave days. I can tell you that when the personal days went into effect right after Act 10 and the handbook implementation, um, the rationale for excluding 12-month administrators from um, being eligible for a personal day had to do with the fact that they receive vacation days. However, on the flip side, we have a multitude of employee positions within the non-affiliated group that are 12-month employees that receive vacation days and were granted a personal day. So as we look at all the inequities that we have, that's an inequity that exists currently. So regardless, a 12-month person gets 13 leave days. Um, our proposal moving forward is that school year staff would get eight sick days and three personal days. So it keeps their leave allotment the same at 11 days. Um, and 12 month employees would get 10 sick days and three personal days, which again keeps their allotment at the 13 leave days. The same, it's the same leave allowance, just used in a different way, trying to provide flexibility to staff. So that's the first piece of, of this component. As part of that component, what we currently have is that personal leave accumulation can go up to five days. So you get, currently you get one a year, you can accumulate them up to five, but then at that point in time, it's a use it or lose it type of a system. And so the conversation among the committees was we're really, we're really forcing people to use a personal day even if they think that they don't need to necessarily because otherwise they're at the risk of losing it, which wasn't advantageous, advantageous to folks. So the proposed would be to have the personal leave accumulation still be up to five days, the same that it is now. But once somebody's maxed out at those five days, at that point in time, the next round of personal days that would go into their bank would become sick days. So there's no loss of a benefit to employees. It's just, again, shifting the um, kind of the buckets of leave that are available, but still keeping the days the same. Still included in that flexibility component Currently, if you ha we have a provision that if you use no sick leave days throughout the year, you have an opportunity to have an additional personal day earned for the following year. So and it's a, um, for school year, it's a, it's a school year schedule. For 12 month, it's a 12 month schedule. But if you don't use any sick days within that time frame, then the following year, you get an additional personal day. So again, keeping the leave allowances the same, just looking to create some flexibility in that the proposal would be to divide it up by semesters for school year folks. So if you go all the first semester and you don't use a person, sorry, a sick day, you'd have a half of a personal day um, earned after that first semester. And if you went um, again for second semester, um, again, it would be a 0.5 personal day if no sick leave was, was used during that second semester. 
So again, that's semesters for school year and 12 month employees that would be determined in January and July because that would be halfway through their employment period. So again, same leave, just allowing people to use it a little bit differently. Um, I can tell you that everything that I just got done explaining to you, all those leave provisions, we've taken that information to the ERC and vetted those things through the ERC, the Employee Relations Committee. Um, so we've talked to all the people involved, um, including the comp committee and then the ERC. So that, that piece has been, has been taken care of. Button does. <laughs> <laughs> Never pushed that one before. <laughs> before you go on to other ideas, is there any downside to doing those things? Thank you. Talk among the committees about having more leave available. Um, but what they're really talking about, the conversations we've had with people, it wasn't like, you know, viewed as vacation days. It was my son or daughter's performing in a state whatever, and I have to take a day without pay to be able to go and, and watch them. Or my kindergartner's in the school play, and um, I need I need to take time away from work without pay to be able to go support my child and different things. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to save up five days and take a trip to Aruba. Um, it was more so these small, more personal type things that people thought that they would have an opportunity to, to participate in without having, having to take time without pay from work. I think that one of the concerns that some of the people had was, are we going to see a greater increase in leave? Um, being utilized than what we'd seen in the past. And um, a conference that Abby and I went to um, in December with uh, both of our state organizations represented, there was a whole presentation on this type of thing. And, and what they see is that maybe in the very beginning there might be a spike that you hadn't seen before, but then by the end of that first year, it all kind of balances out. And, um, and they, they didn't see any major issues with more leave allotment being utilized than what they had anticipated or could handle. But it's certainly something that the committee has talked about. We need to watch to make sure that we're able to um, fulfill these absences. And again, just like any other personal day, it, if you, you can't take your personal day if you don't have a sub, um, a, you know, arrange for that absence. May I speak? Go ahead. Um, I would think this would help the sick bank and the people might want to donate more willingly to that, but my question is, do you have any restrictions of when people can take personal days? Mm -hmm. The current restrictions would still be in place um, even if we went forward with the flexibility component. Um, personally, there's a limit before and after a, a break, so winter break or spring break. Um, there's a limit of 40 personal day absences throughout the district, so it's not limited to a specific building or employee group. There's just 40 within the whole district. Um, in the time that I've been here, we've never gotten to the point where we've had to turn people away because we've reached that 40. Um, there's also a provision that indicates that you can't use a personal day on a PD or IP day. Any type of professional development that the district puts on, you can't have a personal day during that time either. And those would all still be in place. Any other questions on this one? Oh, Commissioner John. <clears throat> so when somebody takes off um, a certain amount of time, is, is there uh, brackets of time that they need to take off, like two hours, four hours uh, per, uh, you know, for that day? It used to be um, up until this year that you could take off per the minute. You could take off you know, three hours and 16, 16 minutes. Um, and what we realized was that on the back side, um, in the organizational part of things, that really mixed things up for people's leave balance because now you've got this little pot of leave that's really yours but you can't use because you're not going to take off for you know eight minutes um, and so the ERC changed that language this past year so that you had to take chunks of your absences in 15 minute increments it doesn't mean it needs to be from 2 to 2 15 it's just any 15 minute increment so that it's more easily measurable but I know that there are some districts who require personal leave be taken as a full day you have to be gone for the full day that isn't something that we're interested in Okay, so moving on. Um, so these are some of the things that there's been some conversation about and these areas just require more, more due diligence on our part um, and with the time frame we didn't have it. So one of the things that staff talked about was <clears throat> allowing their, their own personal children to attend the school 
in which they work. So for an example, I live in the Lakeshore attendance area, but I teach at Robbins. I'd like my student, my, or sorry, my ch child or children to come to Robbins with me. Um, I think that on the surface, as we've had, co we've had conversation about this, um, there seem to be a lot of um, positive reasons that you'd want to do that. But I think as we've dug deeper and, and talked about some of this stuff um, at ERC and with some other employee groups, uh, there's probably some more pit holes that we need to do investigating of um, to make sure that this is something that could actually be viable. So this one might or might not come down, come to you down the road farther. And as part of that vetting, going through the, kind of the regular intradistrict transfer process, so that you know we're um, you know not overloading the schools that are already over capacity. Yep, that was a lot of the conversation that happened. Was you know you get to that targeted class size at elementary or um, eligibility questions at the secondary and so it gets to be a bit more complicated than what it appears to be on the surface so again we need to do some further digging um, the next one is staff recognition and appreciation and we saw this through it was, it was a common thread between all the groups um, and I've just kind of summarized some of the high points that everybody shared but one of the major ones was they'd really like to see all of us in their buildings more often Board members, district office administration, um, come you know come into our classrooms, come into our buildings, see what's going on, so that you can speak eloquently about the things that are happening, literally in the buildings within the district. So that was something that we heard about. Okay, um, I would um, as you look at that, I would um, when we're getting invitations, the earlier the better. So if I you know I don't even go into my board email every day. Sometimes maybe once a week. So if somebody sends something like, hey, tomorrow we have this event, like I. I appreciative that they thought of us, but if they can kind of put that on their checklists of, you know, having the partnership coordinator looking ahead to the calendar for the month or, you know, the year and kind of get in the habit of inviting us further ahead of time, then maybe we can make room in our schedules. Great suggestion. Um, the second point that I wanted to point out is that they're just looking, they're just looking for a thank you. You know, um, we talked a lot about, I mean, again, being cognizant of the, the financial situation in the district, they're aware of that. But it's that simple, just being recognized for um, something that they've done. And an example that was provided, and granted, we're in a committee while we're talking about this, and the comment was, you know, all the different committees that we sit on, we volunteer for that happen outside of the workday, even if we just got a certificate of appreciation that said, hey, thanks for being part of, you know, this compensation committee. Now, in my mind, that I was very surprised by that because my thought was, Okay, I facilitate a lot of different groups and a lot of different committee meetings, and I'm thinking, if I gave a certificate to everybody that participated, I'm envisioning that their viewpoint of that would be, seriously, Kay? I just spent the past seven and a half months hanging out with you every Tuesday night for four hours, and this is what you're going to give me as a certificate? And, but when I raised that point, they're like, no, seriously, that would really, that would mean a lot to us. They're like, this is volunteer time for us. We get that. We understand that. But if somebody could just recognize that we put the time in, that would be great. So that was a huge eye-opener to me because I really thought that it would be viewed exactly the opposite. So, so that was a big one as well. Um, promotion of great things that happen in the schools. And we've kind of seen some of this as the referendum conversations have been happening, as teachers have been coming up and talking about the things they're doing in their schools. But there's a lot of conversation about really utilizing social media and the district update to promote things. And there were some suggestions that were made about, you know, we get the district update once a week. And wouldn't it be great if when you open the district update, the very first thing that you saw was maybe some special or great thing that was happening at one of the three levels, or maybe all three levels, so that every time they went to that major communication tool for the district, they saw something positive where we're promoting what people are doing in the buildings. So that was another really good idea that they had. And then again, trying to figure out how to, how to manage that social media part, um, knowing that that's a kind of an untapped potential for us. And then the last one I just wanted to bring to your attention was the idea of a district paid staff appreciation breakfast or lunch once per year. And again, talking about the money part, everybody's cognizant of that, but, but their idea was more about having a business partner. So maybe it's Gordy's who, you know, sponsors the breakfast at whatever point in time and having board members and administrators there to visit and talk with people on a more casual and social level versus, you know, we've got this big major thing going on, can you be here? But that conversation had more to do with community partnerships um, and having people come into the buildings and kind of some of these options than it did saying, well, you know, we need, we need a free breakfast. So it was more about those community partnerships. Great idea. There is a, um, a group, uh, 
support Eau Claire Public Schools group that is thinking of doing exactly that. Excellent. They are looking at that. So. Okay. Um, the, now the rest is all Abby. <laughs> <laughs> it's all money stuff. All right. So some of the other things that we are still investigating are the district offering of a Roth IRA and the 529 plan. And basically this would be a benefit to our employees where we would just take their contribution to their Roth IRA or their 529, which is the Edvest program, out of their paycheck and um, get it sent to the, the investing company. Um, we've started doing some investigating with that. Um, if it's something we want to move forward with, then we would kind of want to draft some parameters because we don't want to have, um, you know, 50 different investment choices for all of our employees. So um, Tammy, um, the payroll manager, and I are working on that, and eventually I think we might, if we can make it work um, administratively, then we'll be bringing it forward um, just to let you guys know that we're adding that to one of the things that we can do for our staff. Um, Something else that we um, heard from a board member last week was why don't we reimburse up to $50 for a professional staff required license? Um, so professional staff would be our um, administrators and our teachers. And so this is something that um, we will be exploring because $50 times, we talked about 850 certified people um, over the course of five years because the license is valid for five years it was around forty two thousand dollars not everybody renews at exactly the same time so that might be something that would be a low cost or something that we could do to help promote um, you know just the morale and attract people to our district I'm not sure a lot of districts are doing that so um, that's another one that we are investigating at this point in time um, one thing that came up through our um, committee meetings were just that making sure every staff member has a secure location to lock their personal items. It's hard to feel safe at your workplace if you don't have a specific place to do that. Um, so we'll be having a discussion um, this week with the principals at the principal meeting just to find out how many people is this affecting and at what level. Um, we did get some feedback from the middle schools. I know that um, staff there um, do actually have a locker where they can put their stuff. So again, it's something that we'll be investigating, getting some information from principals and then working with buildings and grounds to see um, if that's something that we can make happen. Are there other questions? Mr. Lugamil. So have members of the different compensation committees made inquiries regarding our fund balance? and options there that might exist um, in the short term? We have not really talked about fund balance at all in the committee meetings. Okay. Mr. Abbott, please. We did bring up the amount that is in, the, in our working capital right now. And um, it, it really is sitting pretty well right now. But that's not to say it should be used in a way that would deplete it down to a way. So I think that's a conversation we have to have to have, you know, and that everybody's aware of why it's there and what it's used for and what can we use and that wow. sort of thing for immediate needs. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I would say that's a different topic yeah. than here, though, because we're talking about <laughs> uh, other ways, the non-financial non ways. Uh, right, mainly, mainly, so. or low-cost yeah, financial low cost, ways, right, yes. Right. <laughs> Okay, good. Let's All go right. to the next one. And this next one is where um, uh, our last agenda item is where um, we really want some feedback from the board to the compensation committees, in particular to some of the leaders of the compensation committee. Um, uh, give them some guidance on, on a couple of these items. You'll see what we mean in a minute. Um, it's kind of areas where the uh, committees are stuck a little bit and they just need some guidance. Oh, Commissioner Johnson. Before you move on, um, I thought I heard Kay say that there was one item that they were ready to move forward on and I think maybe that was the flexible leave and so if maybe we should weigh in on that so that it can come before for a resolution good point um, so that was early on right one of the early items about flexible leave is the board okay uh, bringing those forward uh, those flexible leave options that they were mentioning thank you for bringing that up okay okay all right yeah thank you All right, so um, this is our presentation on compensation and some things that we um, currently are asking for some assistance for. Um, so just an update, and this was shared with budget development last week. Um, basically just 
the desire to get some numbers of what we currently know and then um, giving us some background to kind of help us um, in our work with the compensation committees. Um, the compensation committees have seen these numbers, so there is nothing that they haven't already seen, but this is more um, an, a chance for us to kind of talk with the board and let you know what we're seeing so far. So um, uh, based upon the current schedule, if we wanted to move one step for all employees, for the 15, 16 year, that projection would be about $1.2 million. And I gave you the breakdown by each of the groups, but I think it's more important to look at the total cost for the group. We've had a lot of discussions about honoring years of service in the compensation committees. And so um, I've been asked to bring forward the cost to move people forward up to four years since Act 10 because since Act 10 we have not had bargaining any longer and so prior to Act 10 we can't really honor years of service because they, I don't want to say you can't honor the years of service, but it's, it was a different arrangement because benefits and salary were bargained prior to Act 10 where now, um, you know, honoring years of service we can, we can value what the last four years is. Um, so again, based upon the existing salary schedule that would be a cost of about $3.5 million to the district to honor up to four years. There's one group that would um, only have up to three years, and that would be custodians because there was no funds added to their salary schedule in the 13-14 school year. So that cost is reflected there. One thing that is also important for me to um, note to you guys is if you look at the one-year movement for non-affiliated, it's about $90,000. And if you look at this screen, um, moving up to four years, you can see non-affiliated is about 45,000. The main reason why there's that big difference is we have several steps, I'm sorry, several positions in the non-affiliated group that have one step for their salary. So there isn't any opportunity for them to go beyond or earn more because there's only that one step. Um, so that will be something that the compensation committees are looking at as well. But I just wanted you to understand why such a big difference moving one one year to four year for that group. Okay, so um, so before we move forward, I, I would I want to go to that last one because on our list, on our list, if you look in our agenda item, uh, what I wanted feedback was on years of service, vacation days, uh, a part of utilization is HEBA's data, which we'll talk about, and increments, meaning moving along lanes. This first one she just brought up was the years of service question, right, Abby? These, Correct. These first two slides. Basically, we need feedback from the board on. Are, would you are you considering um, having people catch up on their years of service uh, or uh, at least starting move in the previous slide, maybe we'll go back to the previous sure. slide, um, uh, a less ambitious thing of just starting them to move again <laughs> uh, along their uh, progression of years of service. That is really what they need some weighing in on. You can see the difference in cost. This one is just moving them along, starting them moving again, and the other one is catching up on years of service. So I. We, they really need some feedback from the board on how they feel about this. Commissioner Hammock Boyle. The, the, the next slide is where we've been talking about fixing those that have been stuck. And when we hire, a, we hire new staff, they're pulled, in on the, they're pulled in at a higher wage, right? So that's the difference between moving the one step here and going to the next slide, which would fix that piece that's been sitting there since I've been on the board and that the staff has brought up repeatedly. Uh, correct. Just okay. to rephrase it, th this piece is to go back. And if they had started moving along four years ago, where would they be at and how much would that be cost? That, that's what that's, that is. Yep. So, Commissioner Luganbill. I certainly advocate for that slide. And I think that, you know, it's important for everyone to just be reminded that folks have just they've effectively taken a cut all these years and I you know we can add on now but if we can in a sense catch up or um, remedy some things that we can fix that's what I would lean towards Commissioner Johnson I would only advocate for the bigger slide as part of the referendum question um, I don't think that we can you know, then what? I mean, we go to the community and say, okay, so we did dip in another 3.5. That's going to actually make our deficit for future years worse. So what if the referendum fails? Now instead of having to cut 7 million, we have to cut 10 million. 
So I think that's unrealistic. And to go to the community and say, we're going to raise them anyway, we're going to dig in and fund balance, they're going to say, well, then you don't need extra property tax dollars because you figured out how to do it. So I would only be comfortable even kind of putting on the table for 1617 the the 1.1 maybe and frankly if we can find 1.1 we can find 280 and start kids earlier yeah and I and the the first part of what uh, Commissioner Johnson said is would you even consider this as incorporating a referendum you don't have to answer that now but um, you would have to think about you know politically and other other ideas if if you would even do that part so Board members, other, I could use you to weigh in a little bit on this. Commissioner Duex. Well, I tend to be more conservative about it, uh, depending on the referendum. So I, I'm favorable to moving one step. But I'd like to, I don't feel like I've seen the whole picture yet. Um, you know, as far as salary, I know everybody's behind. But we have to get all the stars aligned, and I don't think we're quite there. Others? Commissioner John? I would be in favor of this if a referendum will pass, but I think this is going to be a barrier in the referendum. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Vu? I'm going to support this slide, not the first one. I hear what the board's saying, and um, this would have to go with a lot of educating our community, but this is the piece that I've had more staff in the three years I've been on the board approach me about than anything else, and I think it's a contribution to why we're losing some of our staff, and that is a, that's why I would, I would go with this. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, just um, I guess to add, you know, if, again, looking at the 1.1 as opposed to the 3.5, um, I think we also need to look at, you know, if it's a one-year fix to get us to that referendum, then we need to look at other things we might be able to go, go without for one year. So, um, you know, I'll pick on us, you know, I, I would say nobody travels to the national conference this year so that we can put our little bit of money back into that. Um, you know, so we look at some of, you know, out of district travel or, you know, just other things that we could go without for one year to, to find that 1.1. 1 .1. Um, because again, you know, obviously we're all optimistic the referendum will pass, but if it doesn't, it makes the next board, we're basically just, you know, putting a bigger burden on their plate, and that seems a bit unfair. I, I myself am certainly uh, hesitant about this. Um, I, I absolutely want to start the first slide. I absolutely want to start moving employees along their lanes. We need, we need to do that. Um, I would like maybe some adjustments so that... Um, our current situation where people are at the same as new hires for a little while uh, some adjustment in that but I'm not sure I'm willing to go <laughs> that much on the next I'm, I'm not sure how that will do in a referendum which ultimately that's the only way it's going to happen right I mean if if it passes in a referendum so um, just just my political side says I don't know if that's a sell um, uh, on that uh, that's where I'm so you can see board members are kind of all over the way on, on their values. Um, just kind of when I, when I look at uh, the, the numbers, uh, the, how, you know, how we've all talked about it, um, we've got about three or four who seem pretty certain they want it, uh, and a few that are concerned about the financials. That's kind of how I'm adding this up right now. And I know that's not great help for you in that sense because it's a split, but um, certainly I think board members are being realistic here. Uh, but they want to try the best they can for the staff. So the board members want to weigh in. Is, is that a realistic, uh, good summary of what I'm hearing here <laughs> on this? Commissioner Duex. Well, I'm just particularly um, guarding us as to what's going to get around about what we're doing for a referendum. And if, you know, if we start saying, well, this is what we're going to do, 
give uh, make up all the past salaries, I I would question whether the community would go for that. So I would start slower and and try to work into it after we pass the <coughs> referendum, and see what we can do for the employees. But at least they would get one step, and that's why I'm thinking, what's what's the backlash if we just dump that out there with uh, four million dollars? Yeah, yeah. Uh, others, Mr. Vu. We spend quite a amount of time and money in our studies. And the study point out that we want the district to be solid and moving forward and attract the best. So when we found the number, we are afraid we're taking a step back. So why did we spend time looking into the truth? Good point. Mr. Zhang. I agree with that. My only reservation here is if we don't have it. All right. I don't know if this helps you. Um, <laughs> not that, that as much. That was the goal, was to help you <laughs> on this question. Um, just just um, one clarifying point based upon what you guys have been talking about, this is on the existing salary schedule. And so these are things that, um, I have another slide later on, so we'll be talking about it again. Um, but these all come into how we transition into the new schedule. So sure, I can project based upon the current schedule that's in place right now, but just from our discussions and changing the salaries, you know, these numbers are not based upon the SEBA study at all. These are based upon our current salary schedule. And so we know that we have a problem in many of our groups. And so as we bring up the base in the certified group or we bring up the numbers in classified, these numbers are going to get bigger. And so that's why it's important to have this discussion because that will also be part of the transitioning piece and how do we transition people onto the new salary schedule. And I have some more things that we need some input from as well. So it'll come back up, but I just wanted to be really clear that this is on the existing schedule and is outside of the CBIS study currently. And these these numbers would be larger on the new schedule, most likely. I, yeah, I have a strong feeling that they would be higher. I know at least in the certified, the number would look different because we're bringing up the base for the bachelor's degree about $2,600. And I think the master's was around 30, it was close to 4,000. So um, we have a lot of people that fall into those categories. So I don't know how it wouldn't be different. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Then. Okay. Okay, so these, um, the next few slides are really some additional requests for benefits that we're getting from school year employees. And so I think it was at the last board meeting that um, there was a request to um, cost out what would it cost the district to give support staff an additional holiday pay day. Um, so, so for the district, it would cost us $269,000 to add one more paid holiday for the school year employees. Um, just so you know, they currently get three paid holidays, which are Labor Day, Thanksgiving Day, and Memorial Day. They um, have school breaks off and then they also as a 10-month employee they get 12 months of insurance um, even though they're not working they they pay the same amount in the summer as they do during the year so that's an added benefit that I know other districts are looking at and saying okay if you're a school year employee we want to prorate your hours over the course of the year and then you actually pay more for your insurance over the over the course of the year Versus in Eau Claire, we have a big, it's a really nice benefit that the board put in place a few years ago when they said everybody's going to pay 87.4% of your health insurance, whether you are a school year employee or a 12-month um, employee. And so I think that's just important to remember that those are additional benefits that they're also receiving as well. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't add a holiday. I just wanted to um, remind everybody that those are some additional benefits they get um, as a school year employee. So, is that it for this piece, the, 
vacation. Um, that's enough. yes for the holiday pay. This okay. is it okay. for that. So, piece. so this was the other piece to weigh on uh, about <clears throat> excuse me about vacation days or holiday. Uh, so, uh, just to summarize, they have three paid holidays. Uh, they get school breaks off. So the question is. Is the board willing to pay for more holidays for employees, essentially? Mm -hmm. And is, I don't know, ha have you had a lot of discussion on this in the compensation committee, or is um, it just a, a request, basically? Or uh, yeah. yeah, I think right now it's just really a request. request. Okay. I think um, it may have come up at a board meeting as well in public forum. I'm, I don't remember yeah. for sure. Okay, okay. So I don't know how the board feels about this, or if you just want to. <laughs> Senate the ERC or how would you like to handle this question? Commissioner Duex. I guess I'd rather pay more for teaching days than paid for holidays. I, it's just a, my psyche. Okay, Commissioner Johnson. Just for clarification. So when you say they have three paid holidays, so when you told us earlier t that they are, they have 189 contract days means they were actually working 186 days. Okay. I just don't get how that even makes sense. What difference does it make what you call it? I mean, they, they're not really contracted for 189 days and get three holidays. They just have to work 186 days. I mean, you know, why do we call, you know, Labor Day a holiday but Christmas isn't a day? I, it, it just is calling something what it's not mr. Vu. well my thought is that if you are not getting anything at all that would be terrible but if you can up something and low another I would prefer that if we have the bigger package for the compensation this would not be an issue I mean this holiday would not be matter so we have to want, do one or the other, not both. Uh, everyone's nodding your heads. I'm, maybe I'm lost. <laughs> okay. Can you clarify? I didn't quite. I, didn't quite I would that. echo that. Go ahead, go ahead Commissioner Sean. I would echo that. I, I don't think we, we have the, uh, the means to do both. So, but I... I I would love to make sure one of them, you know, gets passed because I think this is going to help with our, uh, uh, the stability of our uh, staffs. Uh, so just to make clear, when you say both, you mean this and what? The other. The, the, vac the years of service? Is that what you're talking about when you say both? Well, if it were to go with the first slide, then I would advocate that we add this one also. Okay, so I think I may have spoke a little too soon then. Uh, to add four, uh, four steps of movement and to add this, I think would, uh, would be way too much. Okay. Rich, could I clarify? Sure. Okay. So I see how quickly you said, sure, absolutely. <laughs> um, so the, the communication about the holiday pay came in um, when it was evident that the labor market information we had indicated that our positions were as low as what they were in many of these, in many of these um, employee groups. And so then it was, well, if you can't give us the raise that we need to be at to be at labor market, then you know, can we look at a holiday? Can we, I mean, it was kind of brainstorming. If we can't do the second slide, you know, the, the honoring the years of service, then what else could we do that might not be such a big price tag? So I don't think it was ever intended to be, you need to give us, you know, the four years plus another three holidays. I think it was more so the conversation surrounded the fact that, well, if we can't get to what we're supposed to be at for wages, then can we look at some other ways to put more money on the table? And this was one of those ways. Did that clarify? Okay. Okay. Other things from board members. I, I I'm kind of the same. I think uh, <laughs> with them. I mean. It, the money goes either way, <laughs> you know. It's basically this. Was, if you added one, you're basically paying them for Christmas or something. It's just so you know. To me, it's whatever the total pot of money is uh, that that's given is the issue for me. So, I 
All right, we'll move on to the another request that's come up, and I know that this was at the last board meeting as well. Um, the vacation costs for school year classified. Um, so to reinstate the vacation days that were taken away um, a few years ago um, would cost the district about $216,000 for this employee group. Now, I know the board has a goal of trying to make all employee groups equal, and so when those vacation days went away, it was because teachers didn't have, or other school year staff didn't have vacation days as well. So we're trying to, you know, I guess, um, is the word I'm looking for here? Even out, or just kind of make make employee groups similar. So if we have school year, they have similar benefits. Yes, pri prior to me being on the board and several board member, a number of board members here, there was those several goals when 20, Act 10 came along that mm -hmm. one of them was equity, similarity across, yes, yeah. right. Um, and so again, you know, by reinstating the vacation days, if we, if the board would so desire to do that, then we would be um, adding to those inequities again. And then we're kind of moving away from our focus on having our staff with our students. You know, we, we hear that a lot that we want our staff in front of our students. And so this would be moving in the opposite direction of that. So that's the other one, the way in on. Commissioner Duax. Will this change in personal days and sick days, will that help the situation so they have more personal days? Yes, it will. I forgot to mention that. So, yes, that recommendation offering the flexibility in their time off would I, help with the situation. It doesn't give them additional time, but it gives them that flexibility in how they yeah, use the I, time. I understood that's the main issue is flexibility, but uh, I, I know they get stressed in their jobs but. well and I think the other um, point for this group was that they if they didn't take the vacation they would get paid out so it was an additional source of income for them and so and I believe it was like a 50 50 split part of the people actually took the time off and part of them actually took it in pay so I think that's why we hear about it because again you know everybody's kind of been frozen at where they're at and so this was additional income for you know half of that group so um, I think that was where the other discussion came from that I'm aware of. Mr. McBoyle. So I've been in part of these conversations as part of the um, classified or the hourly staff. And have we, have we had the hourly classified staff and the certified staff have this conversation together? Because I know the vacation days when we work so closely together as classified and certified staff, it would impact, um, you know, when people were gone. So maybe there's a way that we could discuss this through so that we could come to some kind of resolution there. And if we are working on compensation and to up that piece, because it was the lowest part of the study, maybe this can all come together ultimately um, in a better place. I can tell you, I know that the groups haven't talked about it together. I know that we've talked about it a lot at the classified and the hourly group. You've been at those. Um, I don't think we've talked about it too much at the certified group at all because it wasn't something that they've had in the past. But I think that's a very good suggestion is to look at it and how does it impact. I, I think the, you know, I don't think many good things came out of Act 10, but the one was that we know more about each other. We used to negotiate in silos and we oftentimes didn't know what the other one was negotiating. I think we need to, as we did the compensation committees now, we're still kind of in silos. It might be nice on what impacts the other could have those conversations and maybe you never know as far as people putting their heads together what they could come up with relative to what would make it good for everybody. I don't know. I'm pie in the sky, but I've seen it happen. So, um, uh, just for my comment, first uh, comment on that. One of my goals is to move these committees along, and I don't want them stuck on this. If they got to meet together, I, I want these committees to start coming out with something, especially regarding the referendum. Um, so I would not wait for that conversation between the different committees to happen. I mean, it could happen later. I would be fine with that, but I don't want it to delay. Less getting a structure done like we need done if it affects that. Um, my personal feeling is this, I would like to keep um, the staff similar in terms of vacation days they get. Um, but I feel like this group, uh, especially um, one of our lower paid groups, 
really needs to move along in pay, in compensation in some way, and maybe there's a way of placing them to compensate for that a little bit by placing them on the new schedule more favorably or something, um, or, you know, along the lanes or something. So that's, I'd rather just do it more directly that way than just giving vacation days, and so that everyone is similar, and that, that's my f feeling about it. Commissioner Duax. That, that's why I had my light on. I, I know this is one of the lowest paid groups, and I, th I think we should do something for them, but more in co paid compensation rather than vacation days, as Rich said. Anything else? Commissioner Vu? I would concur with your statements also. I think it's the tradition that the state in general may, n may not pay a whole lot, but it comes with good benefit. And this is something similar to benefits. So we can either accommodate with high pay and less attractive benefit or low pay but attractive benefit. So again, this is similar to benefit incentive. I would concur with your statement earlier. Okay, good. Anything else? Okay. I think that gave you some good feedback. Okay. Yes, it did. Thank All you right, very much. Great. I'm trying. You are. You're doing great. <laughs> okay, OPEB. Um, we've had a lot of conversations about OPEB. Um, we are expecting the new actuarial study in March of 2016. Um, OPEB is included in the charge of the Compensation Committee. Um, based upon a previous board discussion, the plan was to maintain the current benefit level for three years. We're basically at the end of that three years. And there's a big concern that we're hearing across all of the employee groups. Um, if modifications were made that they would be made immediately with no warning and so we wanted you guys to weigh in on that because as people are trying to make decision on if we should retire now do they have to go now do they feel like they're forced into going now because they're afraid OPEB is going to change um, and I think that the previous um, discussions have been that there was no desire to make immediate change but I think it's important for you guys to be very clear and what would the intentions be once we get this new OPEB study and how does that move forward so if you can weigh in on that that would be very helpful for us do you know when that study comes yeah I think it's going to be in March of 2016 it should be in the next two months okay okay board members Commissioner Boyle. we are aware that the the OPEB liability is going down correct yes I do anticipate that it is going down based upon changes we've made thank you well certainly as people as new people move on to the new system that will happen correct and I think that some people that were eligible for it you know with the with the increased turnover that we've had over the since the last OPEB study I do believe that and then the new people coming in with a different benefit I do expect that that liability to be down the last one we had done I think the liability was about 155 million dollars um, and that's about seven to eight million dollars of our budget every year so it's a really it's a really big number so I'm sure that's why um, you know, there's concern as well from the groups, just that's a really big number. And I think that, you know, again, everybody's very aware of the financial situation. And so if changes were made to OPEB, would that free up money that could go onto the salary schedule? And so just, you know, trying to think again outside the box, is there something we should be doing or thinking about doing? But yet we don't want to scare people out the door because they're afraid that something's going to change, you know, very immediately. My, my personal feeling is, um, I would not change anything coming next fall. In fact, I would want to see how it goes with the referendum. And then that's when, after that happens, then we'd know much better our future budgetary picture. Um, that, that would be my opinion. So, Commissioner Duax. And, and in any case, I would imagine that the board would be sensitive to that, but it needs to be graduated. It needs to be slow. It needs to be a plan. And people can anticipate what's coming ahead. So I, I wouldn't think to do anything next year or in the, maybe in the next two years. Just it would be graduated. There would be a plan that everybody would know. Mr. Zhang. I agree with both. I don't want to scare anyone into thinking they have to retire, especially these veterans who have literally gave you know, their whole life to education. Uh, these are also some of our best uh, staffs, and it would be a shame if 
if they're going to leave just because of this. So everything that the last two board members said and agree with. Commissioner Ann Boyle. I couldn't say it any better. Okay. Hopefully that's good feedback for you. I think it is. Thank you. Good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now we get to talk about the compensation committee work and transitioning new, to a new salary schedule. One of the things that is coming up um, a lot at the group meetings is should the increments be the same for all the groups? And so in working on the salary schedule, and the structure, our current structure has ranges of increment movement in groups. For example, buildings and grounds, the average change between the cells is 1.77%. The food and nutrition is much less than 1.77%. I think it's maybe more like 1.5. And the classified is at 1.75, I think, between most of the cells. And so one of the things that Bob has recommended to us is that we try to make them all the same for similar positions. So the projections we've been working with for the hourly employees have been to use a 1.77% model between the um, increments. On the flip side for non-affiliated and certified, we've been using a 2% increment. And the biggest reason we do that is because um, there's overtime res uh, regulations and so certified and non-affiliated, their salary employees, there is no overtime versus an employee, you would have opportunity to earn additional funds if you're working more than 40 hours a week because then you're paying at a time and a half. And as well, the other thing would be job responsibilities are much different for a teacher or for um, somebody in the non-affiliated. There's meetings outside of work that there's they're not being paid for. You know, it's when we leave, our job isn't necessarily done. You know, teachers are grading papers. Um, people are getting ready for meetings. And so just the responsibilities are a little bit different as well. Um, and then the other reason why we're looking or having conversations about a different increment is just being sustainable um, within the new schedule. And so I guess we are just asking for some feedback because, again, when we're talking about do, do we be consistent among all groups for all employees, how does the board feel about that? Um, and just try to give us some guidance as to when we're getting ready to bring forth that new salary structure. Is it okay to be different? Are you expecting them all to be the same? Just give us some guidance on how to move forward with that. One quick question, a uh -huh. clarification question. Um, in the new schedules, they would have different number of lanes right, or steps, right? So, if so, so let's suppose they were all the same in total career as they move along. Would some in the end get a greater increase? You see what I'm saying? If you have five um, at two percent each versus ten at two percent each. Sure. Do you see what I'm getting at? Um, I what do, and difference? I have to think about that just for a minute. I know in non-affiliated, there was actually, we're moving to more of a six-step, and I think certain positions only have one step right now within non-affiliated. Um, some have five steps, I think, in the non-affiliated. In the hourly group, we're moving, to, we'd like to go to five across the board. Food and Nutrition currently has three, and so they would be expanding to five, and I believe the custodial and the classified are already at five so we would be going to five for that group okay so they'd be similar enough. they would be similar and then as far as the certified group goes they would have 23 yeah see two percent over 23 steps is much different than two percent over five correct in total correct in total career. it's very so, different so it's, it's it's like comparing apples and oranges then on what the percentage um be. a little bit and i think part of it it is again is just trying to get that sustainability into the into the schedules and so and we'll be talking about that somewhere on my next slide if i'm i just if, if you can help me get an idea or get us get an idea are you expecting all the increment levels to be the same is it okay to bring forth difference and i guess just you know because obviously that's a very big discussion item within the groups right now and so just some additional feedback to help us kind of continue to work on that all right board members uh, commissioner johnson a couple of thoughts. I think, first of all, I, um, you should ask the quest, question backwards, basically what, what President Spindler was saying. You define the range. And so if we're looking at market rate and we want people not to make less than this and we think that this is a, an appropriate top amount and there's five steps, then you just divide that up in between in some way. And so I, I think it's not the right question to ask us how much the steps would be. I would think that they would be fairly even between the 
the low end and the and the high end and you know maybe it would look a little different if you know if in certified for example you you know want to reward a master's degree well maybe then it's there's a bigger jump at that one step versus you know instead of a exactly even in between but I'm going to um, go back to my percentage discussion and I think you guys even have the the, the chart over there on the wall where I can't see it where um, where equal is not equitable um, and so if you've got um, you know somebody who's taller to begin with they don't need a big box to stand on is that poster over there yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so if you have an employee who's making a hundred thousand dollars a year and you give them a two percent raise they're going to have two thousand extra dollars that, that next year and if you have somebody making twenty thousand dollars a year and you give them a two percent raise they're going to have an extra four hundred dollars that year and just like compound interest you know math questions you start doing that okay now 102 add two percent they're going to eventually the the gap um, and income is going to increase between our low end and our high end and when we go out to the gas station or the grocery store or pay for our kids' childcare or whatever it is we're using our incomes for, $2,000 goes further than $400. And I think that's kind of an essential inequality in our society. And as the only thing that I can control is the microcosm of, of our society. And I think that as a society, that's our number one domestic problem, is income inequality. And I think it is wrong to give percentage increases across the board to people making 20000 versus 100000 We should be giving them dollar amounts. So when we're talking about sales, I'd rather you're talking about dollar amounts than percentages. Thank you. Other comments on this? I, uh, we did mention, uh, we got a little bit in the budget when we talked about midpoint and stuff, exactly Commissioner Johnson's idea about, you know, you start in and your career at a lower end you hopefully by the end of your career you reach the higher end. It would seem to make sense that the increase each time should somehow match that, right? Rather than just assigning a percentage. Am I get, getting you in a bind? Um, you're not really getting me in a bind. You're actually kind of leading into the next um, slide because it seems like it should be that simple. So let's, we should probably talk about these together. Okay. I think it'll make more sense. Let's do so, that. Okay, so transitioning to the new salary, how should we use this, the CBIS labor market data? So in budget development on Friday, we talked about the minimum range of the labor market, the midpoint range, and the maximum range, so the scale. So if we look at an hourly employee, um, we talked heavily at budget development that the midpoint should be at the middle of your career. So Kay and I did some basic calculations. If an employee in the midpoint of their career is at the seven year mark because you need 15 years to retire. Um, if we have the high end and we have the low end and the midpoint is in the middle, we would be in doing a five, set, five step schedule, those increments would be nine and 10% for an hourly employee. See, I don't understand the 15 year, why, I mean, someone just doesn't retire after working 15 years. No, but I think <laughs> that's what's required to get the retirement benefits. Yeah, I would spread it out from zero to 30 years. And the midpoint is 15. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that's another way to look at it. Um, well, Lisa, we just looked at, um, in terms of securing retirement benefits in the district, what's that threshold, what's that benchmark? And so for many of the positions, it's 15 years within our district. So, uh, so that's what we used. But if you want us to use a different number, we're happy to use a different number. I mean, I don't know many people that retire after 15 years and that would be the end of their career so you know if you're thinking the max is the end of their career then I would say 30 years or something so anyhow go ahead continue. so would the guidance from the board be to have a 30-year salary schedule for all of the employee groups I want to comment Well, aren't you going? Aren't Ask you, the committees. Aren't you going by the CBIS data? I mean, you know what would be midpoint and what would be what you should be making at retirement age. Yes. So, Kay and I did a simple example of looking at the minimum, the midpoint, 
and the, the high end. So basically, yes, the, the beginning of your career, the middle of your career, and the end of your career. Um, what we've been talking about in current salary schedules for the non-affiliated group and more so for the hourly group, they're currently at five steps. And so to transition the, the minimum, the mid, and the, the maximum to five years, that would create essentially um, increments of 9 to 10% for somebody who's paid very close, like to 75% of what the minimum range is right now. And so if you have a different, you know, if you have a, a bigger, different variation from the CBIS data, a lower group, those increments could be bigger to get, you know, they'd have a big jump to bring them up to the minimum, but then what do you look at to move them forward? We brainstormed a little bit, and still you could do five steps if you wanted, and then, you know, maybe years one through four, you, you have the same base amount, but then you add on top of it any CPI increase. So you'd get an increase in those years, but but it would just be the CPI. So that was one of the things that Kay and I talked about. And we also tied it in with longevity as well, because of course longevity, um, you know, for the hourly group is after eight, after you've worked eight years, after you've worked 12 years, and after you've worked 16 years. And that could bring an additional, I think once we hit longevity, I think looking at a five year, if assuming you would look be, be at the same level for years one to four, after you hit that magic year of eight, it was like a dollar an hour increase. And so that doesn't seem like a lot, but then once you put it to our population, you know, those numbers grew very, very quickly. So, and we can certainly bring that forward just looking for guidance, or do we spread the salary schedule out like you're saying, Rich, and go 30 years? Yeah, and may maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it sounds like you're saying, it, say, say you start at 25, age 25 mm -hmm. in your career. Okay, you start as an entry level, and you're saying by by 40 years old, you're at the maximum for your career. I'm not used to that, at least in the yeah. private sector. I don't think we were looking at it based upon age. We were just looking at how to get to retirement benefits. And so, I mean, right? Yep. Yeah, and so, I mean, we can definitely go back to the drawing board. I just know that, you know, looking at a five-step schedule ranging from the minimum to the high, if we wanted to stick with a five-year salary schedule, then that would make those increments much, much larger than, and unsustainable was the other concern. Because if you have a 10% increment, then how are we going to sustain that salary schedule? Well, sure, and then you have people at maximum for another 20 years or something. Could be. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is the board, let me ask the board this. Do, do you agree with that, the, the idea that at entry level, someone should kind of start at the low, the, what do you call it, the minimum or the low minimum or whatever it is? That's at some point, whatever we consider the end maturity of their career, that they should get at the kind of the maximum for their career, and then somewhere in the middle, they should be in the middle. I mean, is that the kind of progression that you would like to see in the lane? I mean, that's the essential question for you, right? That's right? correct. Okay, Commissioner Hamba Boyle. Okay, let me. I mean, I think I get this. I don't know if I don't know if we will get the best and brightest in our district if we start people at the minimum. Isn't that the part where we the study showed that we need to not have so many of our, especially our classified staff, at the minimum level? We have classified staff who aren't even at the minimum level. Exactly. Right. So, right. Chris, so, I don't think that was Rich's question. His oh. question was, does a starting teacher make less than a teacher who's been here 10 years mm -hmm. and, a and a teacher who's been here 10 years makes less than a teacher who's been teaching for 20 years? That basically oh, okay. you start off at a lower salary okay. as an entry level employee. I think the beginning of that is determined by our budget, basically. <laughs> I mean, what are projections of our budget? Any other feedback on that idea from board members? Uh, Commissioner Johnson. I still struggle with longevity as different than the salary schedule because if you have a progression where you're making something, something more and, you know, the most you're going to make while you're here, I just still... I don't understand why you layer another piece of longevity on top of it. And I guess the difference is you reward people for being in the district as opposed to years of service. But if we're not if we're not awarding the years of service when they're coming from somewhere else anyway, what difference does it make? I think it just makes it more complicated than it needs to be. I would like you to I would like to get see you get rid of longevity and just apply it to the the years of service. 
I'll weigh in on that for a second because we had that conversation heavily in the certified group last week. And um, that kind of comes back to our original question of if we don't honor years of service and kind of move people forward, we could have somebody that's been with the district for 20 years. If we get them to a better point in the salary schedule, you know, depending on how we place them with the new transition, they could essentially work for the district for 20 years and not get their longevity till 20 years if we place them on step six because they're currently on step two and we need to progress them forward four years. So initially when we had the conversation with the certified group, everybody agreed, let's put the longevity on the salary schedule. But then on the flip side, if we have people that are frozen and we're not able to honor those years of service, then they could potentially be working longer than to get longevity. I think going forward, I think that would make a lot of sense to just build it into the schedule. Um, because that way then it's just part of the schedule. It's easier not to freeze it, not to take it away. And I know the number that I remember was from the certified group and longevity is about $770,000, I think. So to put that on the salary schedule, I think that makes a lot of sense because that, you know, would give some nice bumps to that salary schedule. Um, but how do, what do we do with those people that have been frozen and worked for the district? And I don't remember the example that we used in certified. I know that she's worked for us for probably six, seven, eight years and has probably been frozen for three or four of those. Right. So I think somebody else used this analogy. You're building the plane as you're flying it. But I think the whole point of taking two years to create with these compensation committees is you're building a new plane. And so how you get from the old plane to the new plane, you know, you have to build a little bridge or whatever, you figure that out second. You build the perfect plane and you create a schedule that makes sense so that, I mean, you're basically starting from scratch. And then you figure out how to hold people harmless, you know, so that they don't go backwards or whatever. But create a system that makes sense and then figure out how to get to it. I think though some of those people that 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 glitches that need to be fixed I think we should try and fix them as soon as we can um, we've been and I agree with Wendy I mean we need to build the best possible system but I think some of the people that are hurting and have not and been frozen for four or five they need that needs to be fixed so in other words can we build a structure without longevity but have a plan to transition people appropriately without having it built in. Hmm. I think it's hmm. called an equity increase. <laughs> Commissioner Zhang. Oh, for your original question, would, would I support <laughs> a new teacher starting at a lower um, uh, rate? I, I would do that so long as there's an, an understanding that those that have uh, time in other districts are honored be because if we don't do that I don't think anyone will come here I would agree with that their years of service from other districts to attract them here I agree do we have any other feedback for Abby on this it's getting a little late um, here I can see people getting tired really yeah it is very late hopefully that helps Abby um, I, th I think we're gonna Call it here. Is that that's it, right? For that, or is there is there anything else? Um, um, yeah. Because we I that, that's, that's all I saw in it. We had discussed before. I think. Um, I, I don't know if this is giving you a lot of feedback for that, but uh, is there anything else before we go that you'd really want to ask on that? Because um, because mm. I think board members will have a hard have a hard time just saying, well, what percentage is appropriate? You know? Because mm. I think the idea is let's start people at an entry level where we think they'll come. Yeah and that they feel like they're progressing in their career. Right. And I think that's really the important question, not the percentages. Right. And I think part of our problem is just that sustainability factor. And so, yeah, it sounds like it's really easy to create a structure and lay it out. And as you saw from budget development on Friday, as we got into the nitty gritties, it's not so simple, is it, nope. <laughs> Commissioner Zhang? Um, and so that's why it's important for us to get some guidance because we want to bring forward something that will have a chance of being approved and also will be sustainable because none of us want to be in that point where we're freezing things again. So. Yeah, but in the end, you know, at the board level, we can really only go into much detail on that. And so I think these committees are just going to have to make the decision with Bob about how to do that and come, come to us because, you know, it does get a little too detailed, I think, for us at this level to some extent. Um, so hopefully it helped you somewhat with that. and We'll try and come back if we need to. So. 
All right. Um, so I think uh, the only thing is, is there any additional agenda items from the board? Uh, excuse me? Oh, public comment on this. Is there anything uh, public comment on this? I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, yes, we have some public comment. Yeah, okay. I'm Ann Meyer. I work at South Middle School. I live at 4227 Heartland Drive, West Eau Claire. I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. The idea with the holiday pay, it was um, to offset the vacation days that were taken away. Um, because we realize you need to have us in the classroom so that's where we came up with vacation day or the holidays because we you know we wouldn't be in school anyway the kids wouldn't be in the classroom that's where we came up with the the vacation or the holidays in lieu of the vacation days because um, the 12 month um, classified staff they do get paid for 11 holidays and we were just looking to be a little more equitable with them. So that's all. Thank okay, you. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. That looks like it. Um, any future agenda items? Uh, Commissioner Lugendorf. Yeah. I brought this up at the last meeting, but I really would like the board to take a look at our fund balance to see um, what kinds of things we can legally and what kinds of things we can feasibly do between now and a referendum. Looking at the options. You mean in terms of in terms of using the fund balance for okay we can talk about that in budget Anything else yeah I went go ahead sorry go ahead <laughs> mm. um, I don't know it's been a while a year or so um, we had a report on um, extra duties like coaching and other um, increments and um, we got a report that we were being uh, we we're implementing the Fargo plan with fidelity but I would like I would like to discuss whether that's the appropriate plan and whether those need to be realigned too and since all compensations on the table I think that we should maybe fix some of the the inequities there okay, okay got it all right then I would entertain a motion to adjourn so oh moved. Uh, we have a motion from Commissioner Hammock Boyle. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Zhang. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All right, meeting adjourned. I want to thank everyone for staying so late tonight. We did have a short meeting last time, so <laughs> we made up for it tonight. This program is recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cvctv.org.